show it because it's a lot easier for jurors to actually see something like a chart uh, in considering arguments by counsel. Now, more or less, you'd indicated earlier her closing arguments would last roughly 90 minutes, about an hour and a half. Uh, let's listen to what uh, Judge Lupo has to say now. Let me re-emphasize the fact that anyone who feels he and she cannot control their responses during the course of closing arguments should leave now. There will be no sighing, gasping, sobbing, or audible responses, grinning, or anything else in the presence of this jury. Family members on behalf of the alleged victim as well as the defendant are warned. You may leave now if you feel there may be a problem with complying with this court instruction. Okay, Mr. Grossman, bring out the jury. Thank you. Does the state close its case? The state closes. Does the defense wish to present Sir rebuttal? No, Your Honor. Members of the jury, we're at the portion of the trial where all the evidence has been received. That means all the witnesses have testified, all the exhibits are in evidence that will be received in evidence. The next portion of the trial, as I told you yesterday, is the portion of the trial called closing arguments. Mr. Grossman was very kind to um, pass out your luncheon menus in advance and your lunch is on the way. What we will do is we will take the uh, opening portion of the state's argument. We'll take a half an hour recess for you to eat your lunch in the jury room. We'll then come back and take the defense closing argument and any rebuttal argument from the state followed following the state's rebuttal will be the delivery in writing and orally of the court's legal instructions and then you will retire to deliberate the case okay mrs lash you may begin thank you may it please the court ladies and gentlemen of the jury this time i would like to thank each and every one of you for your valiant service as jurors in this case it is seldom and rare that jurors are required to be sequestered. All of us know that this has required a great deal of personal sacrifice on your part. The state of Florida is deeply indebted to you for your willingness to commit yourself to jury service in this extraordinary fashion. All jury service is difficult, but it is made easier for every person who, sh who, who serves on a jury because jurors are sworn to follow the law. The facts and circumstances of this particular case are the focus of your deliberations. And you must focus on the evidence that was presented in this courtroom. You must follow the law in the state of Florida, which will be given to you at the end of the case by Judge Lupo. What you heard during the course of this trial was not an act of love. It was not an act of sex. It was an act of violence. Rape is an act of violence, an act of humiliation, an act of degradation. It's very difficult to discuss and consider sexual matters. It's very uncomfortable at times to listen to them. And in relating them to personal lives, it's very difficult to realize that it isn't the nurturing, sharing relationship that is the normal sexual relationship. Rape is an act of violence. One woman has come forward to tell the truth. She has demonstrated extraordinary courage to be willing to put herself through what she has had to endure to come forward and to ask that her rights as a victim be vindicated under the law of the state of Florida. Her faith in the court system and her belief that she's doing the right thing. 
has motivated her to pursue a criminal prosecution. She may not have been physically the strongest individual on March 30th, 1991, but she has demonstrated that she has incredible moral strength, fortitude, and courage. These are the material elements of the crime of sexual battery. At the beginning of the case, during the voir dire, we indicated to you <clears throat> that the state is required to prove the material elements of the crime charged. In this case, the defendant is charged with two crimes, sexual battery and battery. These are those material elements which are the focus of your inquiry. Judge Lupo is going to instruct you that before you can find the defendant guilty of sexual battery upon a person 12 years of age or older, by the use of slight force, the state must prove the following four elements beyond a reasonable doubt. The first element is over to you that her age is 30 years old. The state has proven the first material element of the crime charged. The age of the victim in this particular case is significant too as it relates to her maturity as an individual, her sensitivity, her intelligence, and her ability to communicate with you when she testified. The second element of the crime is that the defendant, William Kennedy Smith, committed an act upon which the sexual organ of the defendant penetrated or had union with the vagina of the victim. We reviewed during the voir dire that ejaculation is not even required under the law because rape is not a crime of sexual gratification. It is a crime of violence. The element of the crime is completed when there is penetration, which means the penis is inserted into a vagina, or there is union with the vagina. It does not even require penetration if there is a contact where the sexual organ has union or contact with the sexual organ, that material element is proved. In this case, we have proved the second element of that crime beyond all reasonable doubt. We have proved that through the most scientific, reliable evidence that is available today, DNA analysis. <clears throat> In order to understand how we get to DNA analysis, you have to go back to the examination of Dr. Prosco. Testified to you that the defendant inserted his penis in her vagina. That would prove the material element right there. Number, the second factor is the medical evidence. Dr. Prosco indicated to you during the rape examination, several swabs are taken. She took the swab from a rape kit, inserted it in the obtained forensic samples of the material in Ms. Bowman's vagina. This is the beginning procedure in forensic analysis and a very critical stage that the defendant inserted his penis in her vagina. And Dr. Prosco, 1991, did a physical examination. She inserted swabbing into her vagina and from that swab became DNA analysis. The swab was taken to the Palm Beach Sheriff's Office Crime Lab, where as you saw, Ms. Barbara Caraballo examined it and forward that same swab, that small piece of evidence, to the FBI laboratory in Washington, D.C. The FBI laboratory takes one small, very small piece of evidence and gives you very significant scientific evidence. Dwight Adams testified to you that from the sample, from the swab, in 
her vagina on March 30th, 1991, he can state that the genetic profiling matches the defendant, William Kennedy Smith. The state has presented, in this case, the most scientific, the most, most sophisticated testing, state-of-the-art available right now for identification of semen in sexual battery cases. And we know that that semen came from a swab that was lifted. The state has proved the second material element of the crime charge beyond all reasonable doubt with competent scientific evidence. The third element is that the defendant, William Kennedy Smith, in the process used physical force and violence not likely to cause serious personal injury. The crime of rape in the state of Florida does not require that a woman endure a beating in order to prove that she was a victim of rape. However, in this case, we have demonstrated significant physical. Dr. Prosco, who examined her, was a board certified physician. She has examined in excess of 800 rape victims in the course of her work. March 30th, 1991, at Humana Hospital. She did an examination, and it was her opinion that there was definite contusion. She even ordered x-rays because upon on her examination, she was concerned that there might even be a fracture. And she indicated to you um, that she ordered those x-rays because of that concern. aching in her body. She had bruising on her body. She went to her own physician, Dr. Barry Lottman, who is a qualified orthopedic physician who practices in Jupiter, who had examined her and treated her for a number of months. He stated to you that he could verify the clinical findings and examination of Dr. Prosco. So through two competent and qualified individuals who testified to you in court, the state has demonstrated that those injuries, in the opinion of two qualified physicians, were related to the sexual battery. Dr. Lottman had treated this individual before and testified that he had treated her for injuries related or stress related to her cervical fusion. And in that treatment, he described what her symptoms were tingling in her hands, radiating pain down her arms and shoulder, and that the pain in her chest and the injury in her chest was not related to those findings. The very physician Some local cable operators will be cutting away for a commercial message at this time. Trial. CNN it's Live the trial, trial continues. At the time that he examined her about AIDS, a fear of AIDS from what had happened to her when she was raped, that she was tearful, that her arm shook. All of the physicians not only documented physical injuries, but her trauma and emotional upset and upheaval as a result of being raped. There is no way that this individual could fool two doctors. There is no way that this individual could fake symptoms because those were qualified physicians who documented clinical findings. The state has proven the third element of the crime of sexual battery. The fourth element was that the act was committed consent as defined under Florida law means intelligent, knowing, and voluntary consent and does not include coerced submission. In fact, it's even more specific. Florida law starts with the supposition that... For those viewers rejoining us following a local commercial break, CNN is bringing you live coverage of the William Kennedy Smith trial. 
an individual consents to something by giving some affirmative indication of their approval, either verbally or through their actions. Consent, therefore, requires some kind of overt gesture, sanctioning or endorsing the proposed conduct. The law in the state of Florida gives a woman the right to on March 30th, 1991. The defendant violated her body and violated her law, her rights in the law of the state of Florida. The circumstances leading up to their contact is significant. Let's review these that she gave to you in a court of law. First of all, I would remind you that you had a period of time. She sat in that witness chair for an entire day. You saw her demeanor. You saw her physical expressions, looks on her faces, her responses to questioning, her ability to go through a grueling cross-examination. Was there any indication that this woman had any problems with cognitive ability? Did you see any indication in her ability to reason and think? No, none whatsoever. She had to go through a very difficult mental experience in order to go through this trial. You know that she went through a deposition that was three days long, um, being questioned by the attorneys for the defendant. You know that she has been questioned by the police repeatedly. And you saw her. You met her. You got to know her and see her, her facial expressions and how she responded to questioning. There is absolutely no indication in that woman of any mental problems. She testified as to what happened to her on March 30th, 1991. She had a plan, a tentative plan, to go out with a casual friend, Ann Mercer. And the plan was to go down to Susie's house and spend time with Susie, who had had a baby. They changed their plans and ended up going over to visit Susie and then going out to dinner afterwards. They went to dinner at Renato's and got there about 10 o'clock and she indicated to you uh, and why it was so late that Renato, Renato's was fairly crowded. It was a holiday weekend. Chuck <coughs> father owned the restaurant. They had to wait until it thinned out to go over there and they spent the earlier part of the evening uh, visiting with their friend. When she arrived at Obar, she visited with a variety of people. Uh, Ann Mercer's father, Gregory Cummings, she danced with Chuck, Chuck Desiderio. Everyone who saw her described her as happy and upbeat. The circumstances of Obar that night were established. It was crowded, it was noisy, it was packed with a holiday crowd. She really wasn't there for such a long time because she arrived at 12 o'clock and met the defendant sometime during that time period. Uh, and at last call, we know that she leaves Obar with him. But it's important to understand the time period here. She testified that she had arrived approximately at midnight with Ann Mercer. She's seen at Taboo at 1, 1 1.15, 1 1.30 by Tony Liott. You know, from the testimony of other witnesses that the defendant, William Smith, was at another location, Lulu's, until at least two o'clock in the morning. So the contact between these two people coming together at that location at that time was very limited by time. She meets the defendant. She tells you about a conversation that they have about her daughter in medical terms. And just having observed her and heard her testimony, you know that that's a very natural conversation for her. She has been preoccupied with the care of that child um, out of necessity because of physical problems that the child has had. It's the type of situation where she has to be attentive to that child um, most of the time. She meets a person from a prominent family who is very nice and very nice to her. She does not feel that she's in any danger. 
He asks her for a ride home. She does not feel that she's in any danger or there's any reason not to give him a ride home. When they arrive at the Kennedy estate, he asks her if she would like to come in and see the house. And she says yes. Almost anyone would want to see the Kennedy estate. Almost anyone would want to see a national monument, something that's been well known for a number of years. Inside the estate, the defendant asks her to go for a walk on the beach. It's an ocean front home. She accepts taking the opportunity to go for a walk on the beach at an ocean front home on a very lovely night. She sees Senator Kennedy and Patrick Kennedy at that location. And Senator Kennedy and Patrick Kennedy corroborate to you that yes, they were at that location at that time um, with a woman by the name of Michelle Cassone. They were out on the veranda, which is that area that projects out onto the ocean, a little jetty that goes out towards the east the ocean on the seawall, and they were sitting there um, after they left Obar. When they get down to the beach, the defendant starts to remove clothing to leave. She walks up the stairs to the lawn. The defendant's ego can't take this rejection. He chases her and he grabs her leg. At the point that he grabbed her leg on the stairs, he committed his first crime, which was battery, touching someone without her permission. He intentionally grabbed her against her will. questioned at length about her state of mind, about her physical condition, and I think that's an important thing to review. She states that when she was grabbed, she was fearful. She has a, a very, very serious neck problem that she was concerned about re-injuring. Someone who has experienced this since she was a teenager, uh, that knows that she has to take care of her neck, that even caring for her child, lifting a child, lifting a baby had caused her to have neck problems and that she became very fearful uh, of injuring herself at that time and that she instinctively took off running in a southerly direction. You've seen the size of the defendant. He's described himself as six feet two, 195 pounds. He's obviously in very good physical condition. He goes after her and grabs her and tackles her and takes her down on the lawn the full body weight on her chest. Her description of what happened is consistent with the injury that Dr. Prosca saw when she was examined. She states that his full body weight was on her chest. She felt that her chest was breaking at one point. She was saying no. The injuries are consistent with what she said happened to her. It wouldn't take very much force for a man the size of William Smith to take down a woman. She says she was tackled. She wasn't wearing shoulder pads. This wasn't a football game. She wasn't a com competitor in a sport. She's describing as best she can how she felt when she was taken down from behind. It would not take very much force for a man the size of William Smith and force her on the ground. She described something that was very difficult to articulate, very painful to describe, very humiliating to have to say in public to you, and that's the act of being raped on the ground on March 30th, 1991. To the best of her ability, she described what happened to her, an extremely humiliating and degrading thing to have to do. Her dress was pushed up, and again, in falling like that, a dress that short would easily be displaced or moved up. She fell onto the ground, he pushed her dress up and pushed her panties to the side. This is the act of a rapist. This is not 
the act of love. She describes that his penis was partially erect from what she could see. That did not prevent him from entering her. And you heard Dr. Good testify there are people who become aroused with violence. And this was a violent act. This was not an act of love. Rape is not a crime about sex. Rape is a crime about humiliation. And nothing is more humiliating than to lose control of your body and know that you are being dominated and invaded by someone. She described as best she could that humiliation to you. The defendant ejaculated and she testified that she felt an ejaculation and that she knew that he ejaculated at that time. This event caused a great deal of emotional turmoil for her. It caused physical injuries, which caused emotional turmoil. <coughs> she ran into the house because that's the way she had come out on the lawn. Her injuries were consistent with what she described had happened to her. She calls her friends to come and get her, thinking just of the people that she was with at the bar, Ann and Chuck. I'm thinking they'll stay the overnight. comes in. Closing arguments by Prosecutor Mara Lash. He's telling the jury now that the alleged victim took a notepad, a picture, and a vase from the Kennedy estate, not as mementos, but as proof she'd been there and, as she said, had been raped. When Ann and Chuck come, they leave the estate, they find her total turmoil from the individual they shared an evening with. Her shoes are off, her stockings are off, she doesn't know where they are, she can't understand what has happened to her, where are my shoes, uh, where are they, and they, they're in her car and she doesn't know they're in her car. They go to Ann's house. At that time a phone call was made at 5.25 a.m. And in that, that particular action was significant too because it gives us a time frame where we know where they were afterwards. Ann Mercer's phone bill, 5.25 a.m. There's a phone call from that legal pad on her phone records. So we're able to set sort of a timeline here, 5.25 a.m., and go back and work our way because that's a definite time that we all know from the evidence. She calls rape crisis line at 9 o'clock in the morning from her house which really is not a delay in reporting a rape. She leaves Ann Mercer's at 5, 5 30, 6 o'clock. She goes home. She's lying on her bed. She goes to the phone book looking for help. What do you do when you're raped? And she finds a number, rape crisis line, and called them at 9 o'clock in the morning. From there, she got counseling and assistance who directed her to go to the sheriff's <coughs> office. Because of a jurisdictional problem, she sat in the sheriff's office for a long time until a Palm Beach police officer was assigned. The time delay and the police having contact with her really wasn't her fault because she was at the sheriff's office waiting for them to send a town of Palm Beach police officer. <coughs> On Sunday, March 31, 1991, Sergeant Robinson goes to the Kennedy estate. Now, we police have the medical records. Um, they've taken a statement from Chuck Desiderio and Ann Mercer. Sergeant Robinson goes to the estate and says, and he testified to you, we've recovered some property from the estate. Like to talk to Senator Kennedy about it and gives them a Polaroid photograph containing all three items, the urn, the legal pad, and the picture frame. Sergeant Robinson never got to talk to Senator <coughs> Kennedy. He never knew who, that inside that house was a whole room full of people who were staying at the house. Later, Sergeant Robinson tells 
Mr. Barry, that they're conducting an investigation into a sexual battery, and it's a very serious situation. But nobody talked about anything. Nobody knew about anything. Nobody knew anything about a vase. Nobody's ever discussed anything. Sergeant Robinson had no way of knowing who was in the estate at the time that this took place. And now we have a public statement from the defendant. It's a damnable lie. Well, as police investigators, you go back, and we're now in the early part of April. Gone to the estate. And testing procedures begin at the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. And Ms. Caraballo, very meticulous uh, individual came in here and testified to her procedures at the sheriff's office. In fact, she did the exact same thing that Mr. Lee did before it even went to him. But she testified, and this was a very, very significant forensic procedure. She testified that she examined the dress. She stated no defects in the dress defects or any tears in her dress and she never indicated that the condition of her dress corroborates what she said in the story that she described she never said my dress was torn she never exaggerated she never said he ripped my clothing off she said he pushed my dress up and pushed my underwear to the side her dress corroborates what she said she never made any claims that the dress had been torn or cut or anything like that the condition of her bra, she stated he never fondled my breasts, he never touched my breasts, and he wasn't interested in that area of her body. The condition of her bra corroborates her story. And then her underwear. Her underpants are very, very important, and Barbara Caraballo treated them with very much care. She testified to you that she took cuttings from different area of that dress. And you saw all those little cuttings and little pieces of evidence can be very, very significant. On a card that's called 1-51, she took a cutting from the inside crotch in She told you that she found semen with sperm on the inside layer of her crotch. She takes another cutting 1-5-2, the outside crotch, outside layer of her underwear, inside, outside. What does she find? Semen with sperm. She takes another cutting, 1-5-3, the back center of her underwear, semen with sperm. 1-5-5, the front center between the waist and crotch, weak reaction to the sperm test. All these semen samples on underwear that Mr. Smith tells you she never wore during the sexual assault. That underwear was fairly saturated with semen. His story to you was that she took off her underwear, she massaged him, he ejaculated and went for a swim in the ocean. Okay, there would be no semen on her underwear there. Now we have one ejaculation supposedly on the beach according to his story and then they go up to the lawn and then he doesn't think he's not sure whether he ejaculated or not and we have semen that's saturating underwear right then and there that's totally inconsistent with his story and it's just forensic evidence in the dress she takes cuttings from that dress one two one one two four finds a weak reaction to semen in the back of the dress. And the debris in her underwear, Q10 and Q11, there was Q10 as the dress and Q11 as the underwear. Look at the quantity of sand. It's very, very small. They're trying to claim that this took place on a beach 
you can't go to a beach and have your clothing be in this condition. You can't put your underwear crotch down on a beach and come back with whatever those teensy weensy container of sand. I mean, we're in South Florida. Sand can get on your clothing from blowing, and it can get on your clothing for transfer. It can get on your clothing any number of ways. But it didn't get on her clothing from having sex on the beach with William Smith. It got on her clothing and on her underwear and transfer from him. So we have his public statement, it's a lie, and the investigators narrow down. We know from the evidence that we have that there's semen in the vagina. We know that there's force used. We know that the defendant has been identified. it's important to go through chronologically steps in the investigation that have come out in evidence just to help you set um, your time frame because you have listened so intensely to so much information in a relatively short period of time you must be fairly exhausted with facts and figures and even though you've all taken copious notes and been extremely attentive I just want to go through chronologically some of the factors so that you can evaluate some of the testimony can you see this? Let's start with March 30th, 1991. That's Saturday in the afternoon. Detective will takes her from the hospital and they go to the town of Palm Beach Police Department. Okay, March 31st is Sunday. This is the day that Sergeant Robinson goes to the Kennedy estate at 1.30 and says we've recovered property from the estate. Monday, April 1st, second statement. Additional photographs taken of her bruises. April 6th and 7th, Sergeant Robinson goes to Washington and takes verbal statements from Patrick Kennedy and Senator Kennedy. On April 8th, April 12th, Sergeant Robinson and other members of the Palm Beach Police Department go to the Kennedy estate to do a crime scene investigation. April 16th, four days later, Sergeant Robinson has his conversation with Morgenthau and finds out um, the Berries were in the Kennedy estate on March 30th, 1991. Recall Sergeant Robinson's testimony when he talked to Senator Kennedy on April 7th, 1991. He was not told who was in the Kennedy estate on March 30th, 1991. He did not... Uh, very quickly to Greta Van Susteren. Greta, briefly, what's significant on what we've just heard here? Well, what Mara Lash did is brilliant. In fact, my praise for her goes straight through the ceiling. She established that there was semen on the underwear in the crotch, on the inside, the outside, on the back center of the underwear, and the front center on the underwear. The defendant testified that he was masturbated on the beach, so presumably no semen could have gotten on the underwear at the beach. He then went into the water. The second confrontation, farther up the lawn, according to the defendant, he didn't ejaculate. Well, if he was masturbated on the beach, and if he didn't ejaculate on the lawn, what is her under underwear doing with all the semen stains on it? Very significant scientific, scientific evidence and the most compelling argument to date that perhaps the defendant is not being candid. Well, we'll see uh, how the jury handles this when we return with more of Moral Lash's closing arguments after this word from your local cable operator. For uh, some confusion and inconsistencies in the uh, statements given by Patrick Kennedy and Senator Edward Kennedy about the timeline, when they went where, and the discrepancies in the various times. Roy Black uh, just objected. That objection was overruled, and now Moral Lash is bringing up more charts so she continue with this presentation on the timeline and the inconsistencies in where Patrick Kennedy, Edward Kennedy, and the defendant all said they were at various times. In an attempt to assist you, and it might look a little confusing right now, let me explain it. <coughs> I attempted to set up in this timeline set times throughout the evening so that you can compare across it different people's stories. Senator Kennedy 
first witness and we talked about on May 1st, 12 o'clock, O-bar, 12 a.m. to 1.30 a.m. That was his sworn te testimony in court, that that is the time that he was in O-bar. States he was at the Kennedy Estate at 1.30 a.m. and in bed at 2.45. Patrick Kennedy. We have Mr. Bullock broken clock here. He has a broken clock and time shortages are a problem for him, but his statement was, and he admitted this, that he was in Lulu's at 10.30 p.m. to approximately 11.45. We know the group was in Lulu's. They go home and they go to Obar. Officer Norton puts them in Lulu's at 1.15, okay? This is 1.15. His statement is that he leaves at 11.45. And he states he goes to the Kennedy Estate at 11.45 until approximately 12.30 when they go to Obar, where he stated they stayed for about an hour. They go back to the Kennedy Estate at 1.30 a.m. At 3 o'clock, he's in bed, and at 3.45, he states the defendant, William Smith, went to bed. He puts himself in Obar at the same time that Senator Kennedy did, 12 o'clock to 1.30, 12.30 to 1.30 range. They say they were there together at that time. And they state they go back to the Kennedy estate at 1.30. That was their testimony and they're in bed at 3 o'clock a.m. I think it was significant in the defendant's testimony that there were no times. Although he tried to be helpful, as he said, he couldn't fill in one specific time for us. Yes, Allison. You remember she was the very first witness that we called, a young lady from New York. She bought champagne at Lulu's. She's a friend of the Kennedy uh, younger people. She went to the estate for lunch that day. They had a big luncheon. They stayed at the estate till almost five o'clock. She goes home. They go back after dinner and they play games after dinner. She testified that she went to the Kennedy estate at 10.15 to 11.45 p.m., that they were in Lulu's. And remember, she said Patrick Kennedy picked her up, took her to the Kennedy estate, and that they were in Lulu's, Lulu's approximately 11.45 p.m. to 2.15 a.m. That's consistent with Officer Norton's testimony. She said she came in there earlier, and she came in, and they walked in, and it was a group with um, some girls, some guys, and she sat down at the table with them. She named them. She described them. She had a conversation with them. They didn't know she was a police officer. It was just one of those um, quirk, fluke things where time and circumstances come together in a fortuitous event. We have an undercover police officer in, in Lulu's on March 30th, 1991. We have Marcy Dolan in basic basically she gives us the same time frame she states that she was at the Kennedy estate she thought 945 uh, a little bit earlier the basic time frame is consistent between uh, approximately 10 and 11 945 1145 the Kennedy estate and then she states that they go to Lulu's afterwards and um, Carrie thought they left about 215 
but Martha thought maybe a little later, 2.30. But basically, they gave the same time frame of when they went to the estate, and they did it for the whole day. We had lunch. We left at 5 o'clock. We went home. Uh, Patrick Kennedy phoned. He picked us up. We went out to the Kennedy estate. We played games, and then we all left together. Now, who went to Lulu's? The defendant went to Lulu's. Patrick Kennedy went to Lulu's. Amanda Smith went to Lulu's. Patrick Berry went to Lulu's. Carrie Allison went to Lulu's. Martha Dolan went to Lulu's. If Carrie Allison and Martha Dolan were in Lulu's 11.45 p.m. to 2.30 p.m., so was Patrick Kennedy, because they were together. But his statement gave a totally different time frame. We know that from Lulu's, they had to go back to the Kennedy estate when they left, meaning the defendant had to go back to the estate, and Patrick Kennedy had to go back to the estate. So Carrie Allison and Martha Dolan testified in sworn statements that at approximately, let's say the earliest would be 2 o'clock, Patrick Kennedy and William Kennedy Smith go back to the Kennedy estate. 2 o'clock in the morning. Remember the disc jockey, Mr. Pattinger? He was at Obar on the evening of March 30th, 1991. Okay. And he saw the defendant, William Kennedy Smith, Senator Kennedy, and Patrick Kennedy walk to the door after a last call, which is 3 o'clock in the morning. He noticed Senator Kennedy and he said he waved to him and he knew it was last call. And he specifically said he saw all three of them walk to the door at 3 o'clock in the morning. Senator Kennedy and Patrick Kennedy say they were home at 3 o'clock in the morning. The times just don't coincide. We have the valet Parker from Lulu's. He sees, remember, he's, Mr. Pattinger sees all three of them walk to the door together. And outside, Senator and Patrick Kennedy leave Ovar together in the Chrysler LeBaron. William Kennedy Smith wasn't left behind. And William Kennedy Smith didn't split. He talked to his uncle and his cousin before he left. They didn't have time to go home and go to bed and be awakened and get out of bed and get dressed to go to Obar. They came home from Lulu's. There just is not enough day, minutes in the hour, not enough hours in this day to fit in going to sleep and being awakened by Senator Kennedy. At best, they were back at the estate. They met him and they go out again. evaluating the statement of Patrick Kennedy when he tells you what his testimony is concerning these events you have to consider that he puts himself in bed at a time when he was still in the bar he wants to tell you now that his clock was broken and he didn't have time to carefully consider the time frame when he gave his sworn statement. What's obvious from his statement is that William Kennedy Smith talked to him about what had happened. He talked to him, told him that he'd had a confrontation with a woman in a room. Patrick Kennedy just assumed it was the den and that he gave sworn testimony and he's going to continue to give that testimony. He told him the story about, I pulled out. It's obvious that they talked about what happened in the morning of March 30th, 1991. And you recall Patrick Kennedy's testimony that he didn't talk to anybody about it because it was a bright new day and they all had a tennis game to play. 
I want you to think now while they're playing tennis, getting treatment for injuries that she sustained at the Kennedy estate on the morning of March 30th, 1991. It was a brand new day. We didn't have time to discuss this, what happened at the estate last night. No, we've never discussed it. We've never talked about it. No one knew anything about this phase. The reason that Senator, um, that um, the defendant William Kennedy Smith can't commit to any times is because if he commits to a time, he's got a problem if he has an inconsistent statement with Senator Kennedy, and he's got a time problem because there are sworn and documented times when people are at places so conveniently he can't commit to a time. And you're going to tell me, he's going to tell us from the witness stand that he knew about this allegation on Sunday night and he didn't, you know, have an opportunity to think about his times, to think about what he had been doing and, and to come in here and say he just can't say anything about time. Well, this is the reason he can't say anything about time. It's a very calculating reason. It's not to be helpful. He can't commit to a time. At 8 o'clock, she was at Ann Mercer's. They go to Susie's. They both said approximately 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock. They go for a late dinner at Renato's, 10 p.m. to about midnight. Obar at 12 o'clock a.m. Mr. Leot says she was in taboo sometime from 1 a.m. to 1.30. Okay. She couldn't even have come into contact with the defendant before 2 o'clock in the morning. What time is last call? 3 o'clock in the morning. At best, if you want to push it, maybe an hour, an hour and a half. I mean, you can evaluate the time frames and the testimony. Obviously, if these people are giving estimations, but they're consistent and they're pretty accurate on point of what's going on. These two people were only together at that location, what, an hour, an hour and a half? And not only that, but she testifies she was with other people, you know, all other people at her table, dancing. This isn't a date rape. This is a stranger rape. She didn't know this man. She didn't even have an opportunity to know him. She saw him, famous person. She made all the assumptions that anybody would make. And she had no reason not to. He was interesting. Um, they had a shared interest in, in medical terms. Um, her daughter, problems that she's had, it was an interesting conversation. But it was a short contact between the two people. The defendant a ride to the Kennedy estate. Now she estimates this was around 3 o'clock. Remember, Mr. Pattinger saw them walk to the exit together, but only two left in the car. <coughs> nobody split on anybody, and nobody left somebody in this very close family just to get a ride home. Excuse me. They talked about it before he left the bar. It's obvious. They walk to the door together to drive away. The defendant give him a ride to the Kennedy estate. Okay, she estimates 3 o'clock. Um, you're talking a time range 3, 3.30, because they said last call 3 o'clock. Uh, there's no liquor served. And then 3.30 is the time when the bar actually closes. So anywhere 3 3.30 area. He asked her for a ride home. Sure, why not? Look at the time frame here and work backwards. We have the call at 5.25 a.m. from Ann Mercer's house. That's a fixed point in time. It's on her phone records, 5.25 a.m. Another fortuitous event where circumstances work and you have an event that helps you document 
circumstances. We know that they're in, in Ann Mercer's house at 525 in the morning, and the number on Ann Mercer's phone record shows it's a number from the legal pad on the Kennedy estate. So you know that they had to be at the Kennedy estate earlier. 525 a.m. Work backwards now. Okay. Ann Mercer uh, says they were at the, the house approximately a half an hour maybe when the calls were made. So 5 o'clock they arrived back at the house. Three thirty. 4.30, the time of this rape. Ms. Mercer testified that she got this phone call 4, 4.30 a.m., and she went right to the estate at that time. You can work in this time frame and see how short a period of time these two people were actually together. Work backwards from 5.25 a.m. That's why I had Sergeant Little testify, Sergeant Smith, the female police officer, and I know that in the middle of a case, you can't understand why a police officer comes in and says, I took this route, and from this location, she drove from Ann Mercer's house to the Kennedy estate. And she gave you a time frame, it was about 10 minutes, I believe, that it takes to get from Ann Mercer's house in West Palm Beach to the Kennedy estate at this time of, of uh, night. There was no traffic. She also testified that she... Um, used a certain speed, um, maintained a certain speed with reference to what Ann Mercer had said. So approximately 10 minutes travel time. You know that they had to jump out of their clothes. I think Ann said it was one or two minutes. They were ready to go right away. So if you start at 5.25 p.m. and you know the phone call is around 4, 4.30, the actual time that these two people are at the Kennedy estate is very short. When you take those times, if you add together everything that the defendant said that he did, said this yesterday, there's no time in the world that he did all that, that they did all that. There's no way you can fit his story into the time frame that these witnesses. In taking the bare bones, the minimum amount of time that he gave on the witness stand yesterday comes up to about two hours, minimum of two hours of activity. It just couldn't be fit into the time. There isn't enough minutes in the day. There wasn't enough time between last call, the ride to the estate, and the, the call to Ann Mercer at 4.30 in the morning. Thank you. March 30th, 1991, at 1.15 a.m., we can say with absolute certainty through Mary Ellen Norton's testimony that the defendant was in Lulu's. She saw him there. That's the undercover police officer. In taboo at that time, so they had no contact there. He has to go to the estate from Lulu's because he goes in a car with a group of people that came together and they all go back to the estate. Do you remember Carol Berry when she testified? She said her brother Patrick came up to the bedroom at two o'clock in the morning getting back from Lulu's. Consistent with Marcy Dolan and Carrie Alice in the same time frame, two o'clock in the morning. He came in the same car that William Kennedy Smith came from Lulu's. And they get back there at two o'clock 2.30. In that time frame, and these aren't, can't go to the minute here, but you can work with what these people say and be able to evaluate this timeline. We know that he has to go back to the Kennedy estate from Lulu's and then they go to Obar. Okay, the earliest they could have come into contact together at Obar is 2 o'clock in the morning. And it's even later, depending on evaluation of the exact time frame. But let's, let's give it the earliest possible time they could be together, 2 o'clock. So that gives an hour at OVAR until last call when Senator Kennedy, Patrick Kennedy, and the defendant walk to the door. However, only Senator Kennedy and Patrick Kennedy left in the car. The defendant came back into OVAR. When the lights came on or when it was closing time, to the estate. 
a police estimated it's probably a 10 minute ride from Obar to the north end of Palm Beach, the Kennedy Estate. 3.30 to 4.30 is the time frame for this crime that took place at the Kennedy Estate on March 30th, 1991. The phone called Ann Mercer 4.30 approximately. 5.25 a.m. we had the phone call from the legal pad. And at 9 o'clock in the break crisis line. She gets in contact with the authorities on the same morning after she get back to her home in a relatively short period of time. It's my job not only to present the evidence, but to assist you in your evaluation of the evidence. But nothing that I say is evidence, and I think you all understand that. Um, the basis for this chart is from the testimony that you heard. And this is barely an attempt to assist you in your evaluation, because as you sit there, and you go from one particular witness to another, you don't have the ability to see it all together as a big picture. And it's my job as a representative of the state of Florida to attempt to assist you in the evaluation of the evidence. This is not testimony, and I'm sure that you all understand that. Nothing I say is evidence, and these charts are merely to assist you in understanding the overall picture and to conceptualize the time frame of all these people. The defendant's story was not believable. It's inconsistent with the documented forensic findings. The DNA analysis from the absolutely refutes his testimony. The semen that has been identified throws his testimony out of this courtroom. It's incredible. It's inconsistent with the forensic findings. He offers no explanation of how she got those injuries, except that he said it could have been from her child, a, what, 17-pound child inflicted a rib contusion on her. There's no explanation of her motive her life has been miserable as a result, not only being raped, but going through what she's had to go through to be able to vindicate her rights under the law of the state of Florida. She has been pursued by press. She has given no interviews. She testified to you, and you saw her face. You saw what he had done to her. This has been a ordeal for her to vindicate her rights in the state of Florida, but she has the moral courage and the fortitude to do whatever she has to do because she knows she was raped on March 30th, 1991. No matter who the defendant is, all people are equal in the eyes of the law. There is no aristocracy or no class that is above the law. The defendant's explanation, his motive, her supposed fear of pregnancy is anachronistic at best. All right, he tries to tell you um, that this woman rubbed up against him and relentlessly pursued him in the bar, only to find out she's not even using birth control. That really believable that this, he turns her into some kind of a vixen in his testimony. He was a mere passive person and this woman pursued him. That was the thrust of his testimony. This individual who supposedly uh, you know, quote, picking him up at the bar isn't even using birth control. And yet he states that there's some kind of fear of pregnancy motive here. This woman's had a child. She's a high-risk pregnancy. If she was going to have consensual sex on March 30th, 1991, she would use birth control. It's not only uh, a moral issue, it's a, a physical problem for her. AIDS. He's a medical student. Oh, it was very foolish of me. You're going to go out with someone that you supposedly meet for an hour in a bar, and oh, it just happened so fast that, you know, the interaction between us, and 
and you're not going to use a condom? I mean, that sounds a little bit uh, pedestrian to have to bring out, but in this day and age, it's an absolute fact of life. You can't escape it. People are talking about it everywhere, and he's a medical student, and he's not concerned about social diseases, sexually transmitted diseases. Pregnancy. This man comes from a wealthy family. You're telling me that he's going to tell us that uh, there's never been a conversation in his family about, you know, we don't want to be funding little trust funds all over the country. I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. He's 31 years old. This isn't a 20-year-old, 17-year-old kid in the back of a car. She's a mature adult. He's an adult, and he's responsible for his conduct on March 30th, 1991. He not only raped her, he tried to destroy her credibility on that witness stand, and he tried to destroy her credibility publicly by stating it's a damnable lie. While she went through depositions and court procedures telling people that she's a damnable liar is basically it. He tried to make sure that nobody would believe her. She not only had to be raped on March 30th, 1991, she had to endure humiliation again in that testimony. This woman came forward to tell the truth and to tell what happened to her against overwhelming odds. And she stated she didn't want to be in fear of him for the rest of her life. And she has a daughter. And she doesn't want her daughter to be afraid that she can't report a rape. And I object. That has to approach. All right. Right now, uh, Roy Black has objected to some of the uh, points that Moral Lash is making in her closing argument, so they've uh, approached the bench with that. While we have this opportunity, we're going to take a break for these brief commercial announcements. Back at the trial of William Kennedy Smith inside the courtroom right now, Prosecutor Moral Lash seems to be wrapping up her closing arguments. The use of force and without the And now it's time for you people to do your job. And it's a difficult decision and a difficult case, but it's made easier for you as jurors because you are sworn to follow the law in the state of Florida. There is absolutely no reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of exactly what he is accused of. On March 30th, 1991, he raped is guilty of sexual battery. On March 30th, 1991, he guilty of battery. Through competent, incredible, and scientific evidence, the state of Florida has proved every material element of these crimes to this jury. Thank you. Members of the jury, let me let you step into the jury room to eat your lunch. You'll have a half an hour. We're going to resume at 1 o'clock. Remember, no talking about the case. We have yet to hear closing argument from the defense, rebuttal argument from the state, and the legal instructions <coughs> from the court. Remember my book. Don't make me open it up two or two hours or so before you begin your deliberations, all right? Step into the jury room. Well, where Prosecutor Moral Lash has now. wrapped up um, her summation. When we come back, we'll talk with our two legal observers about what's been said so far. First, we'll take these commercial announcements. Continuing coverage of the trial of William Kennedy Smith. There's a break in the action right now. Um, Prosecutor Moral Lash has just wrapped up her closing arguments in roughly half an hour. Uh, Roy Black will get a chance to give his closing arguments for the defense. Our trial attorney and observer, Greta Van Susteren, is standing by in Detroit. Well, Greta, what'd you think? I thought Maura Lash's closing argument was stunning. Not so much for the delivery, but for the content. And it's content that counts. 
because what she pointed out was that the defendant, William Kennedy Smith's story, must not be believed simply because it dis it's in dispute with the scientific evidence. If Mr. Smith had not testified, which is what I advised early on, we would not have the testimony that he claims that she was masturbating him on the beach, and then later on, when they're back up near the house, that he had sex with her, but he didn't think he ejaculated. And the significance is, is that the scientific evidence shows that her underwear, according to Mara Lash, was saturated with semen. And it's absolutely impossible, based on the evidence that uh, Mr. Smith himself introduced through his own testimony, to have saturated her underwear with semen, based on his testimony. What she has effectively done is pointed out all the inconsistencies in the witnesses for the defense, and she's done a very good job, and she certainly has redeemed herself in my eyes. I will wait to hear the defense closing argument and look forward to her rebuttal, but this is still a cliffhanger. Well, let's go to our other trial attorney and observer, Abby Lowell, standing by in Washington, D.C. Abby, do you agree? I agree with part of what Greta said. I think that Moore Lash did a very good job of capsulating the best parts of her case. And if we've been talking all along that the best parts of her case were the inconsistent time frames. The other day, I tried, not as well as she, to do the same kind of timeline that she did to show the inconsistencies. She pointed out the inconsistent statements between Patrick Kennedy and William Smith. We've talked about those as well. She talked very much about the lack of motive for somebody to come forward and say she was raped, which is something that the jury will obviously pin their uh, attention on. And Greta's point is a good one, but I don't think it's as good as Greta thinks it is, because remember that William Smith did not say categorically Categorically, that he did not ejaculate the second time. What he said was he wasn't sure and he must have. And I think that Greta is focusing on that as more indelibly in stone than he said it was. And I think you'll see that Roy Black will point that out. But the one thing I do agree about Greta as is that not in style, but in substance, Maura Lash took the best parts of her case and gave them to the jury. And she did redeem herself from what was a dismal cross-examination of the defendant yesterday. Well, this scientific evidence does not lie. And the problem that the defense has, and the problem the defense must overcome, is that its own witness, its key witness, uh, Mr. Smith, has testified that he didn't think he ejaculated. And that's a very significant point, and I don't know how Mr. Black is going to get around that. Well, as I said, I think that he gets around it by saying that in the heat of passion, the last thing that he was thinking about the second time was whether he did or didn't. But he says, quite honestly, I'm not sure whether I did, I must have. And it's his must have that Mr. Black will repeat, I can assure you, in his closing. But that, uh, must have, but that must have is, is also coupled with the fact that Mara Lash has very effectively showed inconsistencies with time frames. And you take those two points together, the problems with the time as recited by the defense witnesses and the problem with the underwear, and it makes it, it, makes it so that the government, the state, is back in this case. Oh, I agree about that, but Greta, remember this. Somebody asked me yesterday, how do you define reasonable doubt? And I think I figured it out last night. If the jury, as a lot of viewers out there, will now say, I don't know who to believe. I do not know whether to believe her or I do not know whether to believe him because she has inconsistencies and let's say they are fully aware of the inconsistency that you just pointed out. If they say to themselves, I don't know who to believe, they must acquit the defendant because that that's is reasonable doubt. And that's exactly why the defendant never should have testified because that's the posture you would have been in. But with the defendant taking the stand here, it makes it different because what the jury is going to do is totally disregard the defendant's version if they credit the scientific evidence and they're necessarily going to have to credit the, uh, the prosecution's complainant. And that's why it's so dangerous to put a defendant on the witness stand. And I think now, in hindsight, uh, that uh, perhaps it was a mistake. But I'll wait and hear from Mr. Black to see how he recovers from this. Well, I'll give you the last word, Greta, but I totally disagree <laughs> about that. It was absolutely essential that William Kennedy Smith took the stand in this case. It was, well, I acknowledge it was absolutely essential that he do so to present a storyline that picked up those tidbits that were already out there, like the stockings in the car, like leaving the bar when she says she didn't leave the bar, like the brake lights that Patrick Kennedy spoke about. There would have been no way for the defense to link all those disparate items that poke holes at her story unless he did so. Number two is when you have a compelling alleged victim in this kind of a case, not a savings and loan case, not an insider trading case, but a whodunit kind of case, and he's got no inconsistent statements as opposed to the alleged victim, he had to go on the stand. I don't think there's any choice about that. It may be that it gave Maura Lash the only piece of evidence he, she now has, but it was absolutely essential that he do it, and that's something I disagree about. Well, well I love to have the here. last... Let me interrupt here for a moment, Greta, so we can uh, pay some of the bills, and we'll be back with the continuation of this discussion after these messages. And Kennedy Smith, while we wait for the defense to begin its closing arguments, we'll continue our discussion with Greta Van Susteren in Detroit 
Abby Lowell in Washington. Greta, question for you. We've talked about what Morrill Ash did. What does Roy Black have to do uh, when he begins his closing arguments? Well, he's got to come on very strong, building up his client. As I've said before, his client did exceedingly well on the witness stand, uh, ignoring the fact, the problem that's now arisen through Maura Lash's argument, closing argument. But he needs to concentrate on showing that this is a man who came forward and testified on the stand and that the jurors should credit him because his statement, his testimony was consistent with much of the physical evidence. The other thing, though, that he must do is talk about the credibility of the complainant. He's got to make her totally incredible to the jury. And the way that he does that is he emphasizes inconsistencies with her statement and talk about her demeanor on the witness stand. And, and of course, we didn't have the advantage of looking at her because of the blob, but he basically has to attack her credibility and he has to constantly make reference to the fact that it's the state in this case that bears the burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Indeed, Charles, picking up on Greta's last point, what I would add to this is that what he needs to do is what I said before the break. He needs to suggest without exactly saying it that you know, you've got two people saying absolute opposite things. So what do you do, ladies and gentlemen? Well, the law says when you have two people saying opposite things and they're both either equally believable or you have questions that are equally about both, that is the definition of reasonable doubt. You'll hear something like that, I'm sure. He also has to do a couple of other things. He has to quite seriatim go through the points that Maura Lash made, good points, scoring points on her closing, about the motive of the alleged victim, and the fact that William Smith has a motive to tell the truth as well. He has to talk about the timeline, why it is a sideshow and has nothing to do with the real merits. He has to deal with Greta's point about the underwear, and I am sure he will do that. He has to talk talk about that in basic form, William Kennedy Smith's story matches the stories of everybody. You will hear him emphasize the lack of screams heard by anybody in the house, because if that was what she unequivocally said, that she fought, that she screamed, and that she yelled, and they were on the lawn, not one person heard it. You'll hear that as well. You will see him pick apart all the inconsistencies about her leaving the bar to go to another bar and yet failing to say it in five sworn statements. And if Greta wants more lash to hold up the underwear, for her rebuttal, um, I suspect that Roy Black will hold up the stockings because the stockings is a symbol of what is wrong about the alleged victim's case and story. If I were to do the rebuttal government for the state in this case, I would hold up that underwear and I would parade it in front of the jury during the entire uh, the final closing argument for the prosecution because basically my approach from the state would be is that the scientific evidence does not lie. And I think that's exactly what Mara Lash uh, will do or should do during closing argument. Uh, the other point that I'd, well, the other point that uh, I'd like to add is simply this, is that I've been in the shoes of Roy Black uh, dozens of times, and he's going to have a miserable lunch because he's frantically scrambling to, to meet the allegations from the closing argument of the state. Well, next up, of course, is the uh, defense closing arguments, then rebuttal from the prosecution. We have to remind you now that when the jury finally gets this case, CNN will present a half-hour special recapping the testimony. We can't give you an exact time because we don't know when the exact time will be, but please join us in a few minutes when we return for continuing live coverage of the trial of William Kennedy Smith. For now, I'm Charles Jaco, CNN, reporting live from West Palm Beach, Florida. Inside, Judge Lupo is not back inside the courtroom yet. When she returns, defense attorney Roy Black, we assume it's going to be Roy Black, will begin his closing arguments. After the closing arguments by the defense, the prosecution has a chance to rebut, and then the jury gets this case. Once uh, the jury gets the case, CNN will be presenting a half-hour special on the William Kennedy Smith trial to date. We, of course, can't give you an exact time for that because we don't know how long uh, all this testimony is going to take. We should expect that uh, Judge Mary Lupo would come back inside the courtroom any moment now because she's been fairly adamant about this timeline. I'm looking out the courtroom monitor to see if she's back in yet. She is not. Judge Lupo has said she wanted this case over by December 20th. It looks like it may be over well before that. Today is the 11th of December. Uh, they should get the case, as we said, uh, before the day is out. The uh, the arguments, the closing arguments by the prosecution, according to our legal observers in both Detroit and Washington, were very telling. Uh, Prosecutor Morrill Lash brought up one very interesting point, that is the underwear of the alleged victim was uh, had quite a bit of uh, semen on it, which uh, could go against William Kennedy Smith's 
argument that he uh, had manual sex with the alleged victim on the beach and then withdrew uh, when he had sex with her on the lawn of the Kennedy estate. That could be an important piece of forensic evidence that Roy Black, of course, is going to have to rebut during his closing arguments. Uh, Morrill Lash also used a timeline showing that the accounts of the various people involved, Patrick Kennedy, Senator Edward Kennedy, the defendant William Kennedy Smith, a lot of other people such as Kerry Allison, Officer Mary Ellen Norton and so forth, did not agree on a lot of major points. The point we supposed to all of that was to impugn the credibility of William Kennedy Smith, that uh, none of their timelines agreed and therefore maybe the defendant is not believable. That of course is a decision the six people on the jury are going to have to make. The way it will work this afternoon is Roy Black will give the defense's summation, its closing arguments. Then the prosecution has a chance to rebut, then the jury will be charged. That is, they will get their final instructions and retire to deliberate the case. As Judge Mary Lupo has told them, they can deliberate for three minutes, they can deliberate for three months. Everyone here is hoping and praying it will not be three months that they deliberate, but no one knows how long the jury will take because uh, they can take essentially all the time they want to. We've got a little time, it appears, before Judge Mary Lupo comes back in the courtroom and we'll take that for this commercial message. Roy Black is just now beginning his closing arguments. Let's listen. We do live in a democracy. We would soon lose our democracy unless the citizens are willing to take part in our government. Each one of you have gone as far as any citizen in this community to make our democracy work by getting involved in this process, by being willing to sit on the jury, undergoing all the questioning you did, to putting up with us in such good humor throughout the entire process. And I tell you that our gratitude goes out to each and every one of you, everyone involved in this case. You know it hasn't been easy. You know it was a difficult process to go through. I'm sure you all know how important it was to see that there's a, a fair trial. Because if you can't get a fair trial, our system of justice doesn't mean much at all. And each one of you have done your part to see that there's a fair trial in this case. And I think all of us owe you a great debt of gratitude for that. The court's going to instruct you on the law, and I agree also that the law is the most important part of this case for you to understand, because there are certain principles of this law that make this country great. There are certain principles that come right from our Constitution that apply directly to this matter that you have to decide. There are certain constitutional provisions that Will is entitled to, regardless of who he may be. He's entitled the protection of our Constitution, just as anyone else who came into this courtroom, no matter who they may be, would be entitled to those protections of the Constitution. And the first one is that every citizen, when they're brought into this courtroom, are presumed innocent. And the court will tell you to be presumed innocent means the jurors are to believe you are innocent. This is not some form. It's not just something we mouth. This is something we believe. We believe that the person is innocent when they come into this courtroom. Because of that, the state, the prosecution, is the only party that has the burden of proving evidence. No citizen has to prove their innocence. They do not have to put on any evidence. Will did not have to call a single witness. He did not have to testify. He did not have to introduce any evidence. There was no requirement to that because he does not have to prove his innocence. It's the state that has that great burden of proving him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And if there's a reasonable doubt, that means he must be found not guilty. And the court will give you an instruction that reasonable doubt means to have an abiding, an abiding conviction of guilt. That word was not selected loosely. There's a reason for that. Abiding is an important word. It's like an abiding faith. It's something you hold tightly. It's something you deeply believe in. Something you believe into the bottom of your heart. 
That's what abiding means. And the law says you have to have an abiding conviction before you could ever return a verdict of guilty. And not just that, but it has to be an abiding conviction, a proof beyond a reasonable doubt. I mean, there's no higher standard than that in the law than you have in a criminal case. The state has to prove that burden to you. If there's something less than an abiding conviction, if there's something less than proof beyond a reasonable doubt, you must return a verdict of not guilty. And this is the, the key part of the instructions, because those are provisions in our Constitution that every person has. And if we dilute those provisions, then we dilute our entire system of justice. We emasculate our Constitution. We throw away rights that we fought so hard and so long with such difficulty to obtain and keep. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt is the absolute key to this case. And there's not just one verdict here, ladies and gentlemen. There are six individual verdicts. Each one of you makes your own decision. Each one of you looks at this evidence, <clears throat> looks into your conscience, looks into your heart, and comes up with your determination, your verdict of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Each one of you have that obligation to make an independent determination. You can't decide the matter just because somebody else has made a decision. You can't put this decision on anyone else. You individually have to make a decision. And you're the one, when you make that decision, it wants to be a decision you're going to be proud of, that you're going to consider for the rest of your life. It's important to make an individual decision in this case. <coughs> There is no unequal justice in this country. No matter where you may be, whether you be down in the lowest possible job there is, or all the way to the President of the United States, there is no unequal justice. And that also means that you cannot be prosecuted on who you are. You cannot be treated differently from everybody else because who you are or where you come from or what your name is or who your family is. You take a look at what went on in this case, from helicopters to untold number of police officers all around the country, dragging all kinds of things. I don't know how many rolls of film. I don't know how many universities they go to, how many FBI agents, how many crime labs, how many universities. They went after this man with everything they had. And then they come in here and try to criticize us because we have the nerve to defend ourselves. We don't have a crime lab to work with. We don't have the same resources the state of Florida does. All we can do is go out and ask people and retain them to come in and do some work to help prove that this case, the facts in this case, and yet we get criticized for that. They would only be happy if you give up. We said right from the beginning that this charge was untrue. Will said it's true. It is a damnable lie, that the charge of rape is a damnable lie. We have made no apology for saying that, because it <coughs> is a lie, because it's not true. And we have gone forth to do battle in this case to try to bring the truth out because that's what's important what the truth is and it's a search for the truth in this case that's important and you can't criticize somebody for bringing out the truth there's one argument that the prosecution made that I want to address immediately and that's this argument about time. Time in a vacuum is unimportant. What's important is the sequence of events. I know each one of you have gone on vacations, have had times with your family, where you get together, you have a few drinks, you talk, you have a good time, 
You may even go somewhere, like to Disney World. How many people remember at 3 o'clock in the afternoon you were on Space Mountain? Or maybe you might think, someone might say, no, it was at 4.15, and you were on the Great Adventure Run. When people are on vacation, when people are having a good time, you don't keep notes of the exact times you're going places. Now, you may remember the sequence of events, and what's important in this case is the sequence of events. Because you'll see that when you look at the sequences, uh, how important it is. If you bought the prosecution's argument, none of the people in this case would have ever met. Yet we know that's not the case. We know that Patrick and Will went to Lulu's. They admit the people they went with, the people they met there, the things that they did there. The Senator and Patrick admit in their bar, she says in their statements that she met them at O-Bar. In their statements, they testify about meeting Michelle Casson at O-Bar. They testify about leaving O-Bar and going back to the Kennedy home. And Michelle Casson comes along with them and meets them back at the home. They do not deny <coughs> these things occur. They may not have the correct times, but the sequences are absolutely correct. That's the important part of their testimony. It's the sequence that it comes in. And when you look at this time, you will see that the Senator and the Patrick are not by any stretch of the imagination the only people that don't have the right time. Testifies that she goes to O Bar about 12.30 and about one o'clock, she meets Will on the way to the bathroom. Now we know that that can't be true. It's not the times that are important. It's the sequence that people tell you the things that they did, because it's the sequence that put things together. And they all admit meeting each other. It's just that they have different ideas of time. I don't have the, the charts here, but you can even show at the outset of the chart dealing with Ann Mercer. That has an inconsistency. While they have themselves spending two hours at Susie Kerasy's house, she testified they spent between 35 and 45 minutes. Yet, of course, that's not on their chart. A second matter that I wanted to deal with right away is the urn investigation on Sunday. Detective Robinson comes to the home around 1.30. He says he wants to speak to Senator Kennedy, not to Will Smith, to Senator Kennedy, and wants to speak to him about a stolen urn. There's nothing about a sexual battery or a rape investigation at all, absolutely nothing. And all he does is leave a Polaroid picture of an urn. It's not until 3.20 that Detective Robinson calls back and for the first time says it's a more serious investigation involving an allegation of sexual battery. By this time, Will Smith had already left Palm Beach. It, in evidence is his plane ticket showing that he had already had a plane ticket for 3 o'clock that afternoon. And you heard the testimony that he rushed through uh, the house. He was down on the beach, came running up to the house, ran in and got finished putting his things together, grabbed something to eat at the, while running by the table and went on his way to the airport. And what happens when he finds out about the allegation? He calls and talks to people at the home. He gets a lawyer who immediately gets in touch with them. He voluntarily turns over all the samples that they want, photographs, uh, everything that they ask for in terms of examinations, and then surrenders himself when the charge is brought. There's absolutely no evidence that in any way Will obstructed any kind of an investigation at all. And to make any kind of an allegation like that is just totally false. One other part that I wanted to mention. 
Mrs. Lash now argues that Will committed a rape because of his ego. Now, where is the evidence of that, ladies and gentlemen? Have we gotten so far in this case that you can ask the jury to convict somebody on evidence that's not in the record? You can just make up something at a whole cloth, and that's enough to send someone to prison? With no evidence whatsoever, because they have no evidence of any kind of a plan or motive or intent, anything like that. They come up and make it up for you. Is that what we can do in a courtroom now? We can just make up the evidence? They're not required to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt? They can just get up here and say it and that makes it so? But rather than talking about speculation, rather than making things up, rather than talking about evidence that does not exist, let's discuss the real evidence in the case. The evidence that doesn't lie. The evidence that hasn't changed. The evidence that proves the, the true facts in this case. Now you've heard the testimony as happens that she's running across this lawn well, first she's running or walking up these steps and falls down. At least one time fell down on the top of the steps. Now she just stumbled. But then she's running across the lawn at full tilt. She's being chased by a man who's six foot two and a half, 195 pounds, who has, as Miss Lash brought out, size 11 and a half shoes, who tackles her and hits the ground. She is on the bottom and absorbs all the force of that event. Now there's not a freeze frame here, you just don't stop. You're going to slide along the ground, you're going to hit that ground with great force, there's going to be force from both sides. Now you've heard from numerous people this principle in science of transfer theory. What happens when bodies collide, or when a body collides with other items? There has to be some evidence of that. Let's take a look at the dress. Barbara Caraballo testified that she did a minute examination of the dress. The first thing she did is lay out some paper on her lap. This is in, with big tables, with bright lights, with all the equipment you could want, from microscopes to all kinds of enlargers, photography, everything you want to examine. They take the dress and shake it out and they find sand comes out of the lining. That's in this exhibit Q10. She never sat, even sat down on the beach, yet there is sand in the lining of the dress. And there's this much sand, mind you, despite the fact of her walking out of the house, getting into her car, driving her car, getting out of it, going into Ann Mercer's house, sitting on the couch, leaving there, getting back on into her car, and uh, driving away. Despite all that action, there's still this sand found in the lining of her dress. The examination of the dress is done minutely by Barbara Caraballo. There's no grass stains. There's no dirt. There's no particles of grass. There's no mud. There's no chips of concrete. No little stones. No nothing on this dress at all. And yet this dress had a tremendous impact. If, if you believe this testimony, there's a tremendous impact when those bodies, some over 300 pounds of weight after running, hit the ground on this dress. And yet there's not a single piece of evidence there. Not a single microscopic piece of evidence. We've had numerous people, scientists, examine this dress and there's nothing, not one particle of grass, not one piece of dirt, no mud, no soil, no rips, no tears, no abrasions, no separation of the seams, no damage to the zipper, no damage to the sections holding it together. Nothing, not a single iota of evidence. Ms. Caraballo testified how closely she examined the zipper and the seams because these are areas particularly in women's clothing which can be easily damaged. 
And you know how hard at the Palm Beach Sheriff's Office crime lab, you know how hard they looked for that evidence. You can just imagine how hard, how often, how long they looked, they looked for even the slightest iota of evidence and found nothing. Our expert, <coughs> Dr. Lee, one of the most eminent forensic science scientists in the United States, a man who heads the Connecticut State Crime Lab, came down here and did an, his own examinations. He did a visual examination. He did a microscopic investigation. With a microscope, looked at this, the details of this dress, from the hooks and eyes, to the zippers, to the seams, to the linings. He looked at everything that could in any way possibly be damaged with a microscope and found absolutely nothing. Not a single grass stain, no abrasion, no cuts, no rips, no mud, no dirt, no soil, nothing. Black is giving his closing arguments. He's arguing that there was no damage to the alleged victim's dress and no grass stains found at all on her clothing. Blood stains, no abrasions. You will see holes in the panties because the evidence was cut out. And these holes are fairly big. And that's because when they cut out areas, they cut out a much larger area than they need. They just don't cut along the little margin and hold on to that. They cut out a large area so they can do their testing and they make sure they that everything they want is contained within that area. And they came up with a, a couple of findings. Number one, that there are semen stains on the panties. We do not contest that those come from Will. Number two, that on the inside crotch of these panties, they found sand particles. This exhibit Q11. Sand particles are found in the inside crotch of the panties, along with some plant material. What does transfer theory tell us about that? Well, with underwear like this, you're going to get secretions throughout the day. It's going to be moist. If it touches some other objects, objects are going to adhere to it. When you take the underwear off, it's taken off inside out. If it's laid down or is in an area where it can pick up some evidence, that helps us to determine where that occurred. Here we know it is sand found on the inside crotch of these panties. We have in evidence a number of exhibits regarding this. I don't really have the, the time to go over and get them all, but you remember we have all those little boxes. First of all, you can look at Q10 and Q11 and look at it yourself. This doesn't require any great equipment to look at. All you gotta do is take this box and turn it to the side and you can see the sand yourself. The FBI agents testify this is medium quartz sand. We, however, did not wanna just rely upon the examination done by the FBI, because the FBI only looked at it and said this is medium quartz sand. We wanted to find out where it came from or where it could not come from. And that's why we hired a retained Dr. Seeger to do testing. He went out to the estate, went along the beach and picked up numerous samples in various places of the sand to do a comparison between the sand found in the panties versus the sand on the beach. He did the same thing on the lawn. He went there and, and dug up various sections and put it in boxes to make a comparison. <coughs> and looking at, you can look at yourself. There's the photo micrographs and evidence. It's a photograph right out of a microscope. You don't need a microscope to do it. The photographs are there and will tell you what it looks like in a, in a microscope. And you can make the comparisons yourselves to see where these items come from. And the results are, are obvious. Mr. Fiedler from the FBI testified that it was sand. That's all that he needed. We went further. We proved that Q10 and Q11 are consistent with the beach and inconsistent with the yard. You 
also have to look at the evidence regarding the pantyhose. Where was the pantyhose taken off? Was it taken off on the beach? Was it taken off before that? Was it taken off on the lawn? We have sand on the underwear, but there's no sound sand found on the pantyhose. None. A minute examination is done of the pantyhose. There's no sand found on the pantyhose. That pantyhose did not go down to the beach. There is pieces of Bermuda grass also found with the sand in the panties. Where did it come from? We don't know. We can speculate that pieces of grass blow all over that property, down onto the beach. We also know that at one time the panties were taken off on the lawn, on the town. There are many different ways that this plant material can get there as well. However, it is adhering to that sand that's on the crotch of the panties. The fact that there's plant material there is no evidence whatsoever of any forceful encounter. Let's take a look at, at the brazier. It is intact. Dr. Lee looks specifically at the spaghetti straps those parts that were more likely to be damaged. There's absolutely no separation at all. He looks at the hooks and eyes on the back. There's no separation. There's no damage even to the paint on those metallic parts. There are decorations on the bra that are totally undamaged. You can look at, look at these items yourself when you get back into the jury room, and I hope that you will, to use your own common sense your own life experience to examine these items and look at them. Regarding the, the pantyhose, these of questions. Did you have your pantyhose on in O Bar? Yes. Did you have your on in the car? Yes. As soon as we got to the parking lot, did you have them there? I don't know. Did you have them on going into the house? I don't know. Those answers changed as she got to the parking lot. And I think the evidence bears out that she took her pantyhose off in the car along with her shoes and left them in her car where they were subsequently found by Ann Mercer. It's also important to look at the condition the pantyhose was found in because they are inside out. Now I can't tell you beyond any doubt that this is the way she takes her pantyhose off. but. If you put your thumbs in a pair of pantyhose and take them off and step out of them, you're going to get them inside out. However, if somebody was trying to take them off you and was pulling your legs down, they would be come off with the right side. These pantyhose are found inside out on the seat of her car right next to her shoes. There's absolutely no evidence that is in any way consistent with these pantyhose being ripped off. First of all, she does not even say that that occurs. There's absolutely no damage to this waist area. It's not until you get down to the legs that there is damage. In the weave of the pantyhose, there's absolutely no evidence. There's no sand, there's no dirt, there's no grass particles. There's no soil, there's no mud, there's none whatsoever. This has been carefully examined by their experts and our experts. And absolutely nothing is found. When we ask questions about the pantyhose, and, and I admit I've asked a lot of questions, but the answers were, as with many other critical questions, I don't know or I can't recall. In the first tape statement that she gives, she testifies that she took her pantyhose off before she went down to the beach. But now her testimony is that she doesn't recall. The next 
piece of evidence I wanted to talk about is the Polaroid picture. Saturday afternoon, March 30th. <clears throat> this is in evidence. As defendants exhibit 20. I ask you when you look at this photograph, look for any evidence of any scratches, of any damage to her face in any way whatsoever. Remember the testimony. She's running along the lawn and is tackled. She has difficulties with her neck. If she's going to fall, she's going to land on her face or somewhere around her face area. Yet there's not a single mark nothing whatsoever to show that this occurred that's a defendant's exhibit 20. with the bruises you have to use your common experience about bruising all of us at one time in our life have had bruises some people get bruises easier than others taking a blood thinner like naproxen makes it much easier to get bruises. Taking aspirin, taking alcohol, these are all things that increase the ability to get bruising. I don't know how many times all of us have had the experience where you have a bruise and someone will ask you where you got it. And you'll say, you know, I, I don't remember, I don't know. But the important matter regarding these bruises is the age of them. You know from your common experience, when you get bruises, they, that means there's blood underneath the surface. Those bruises are red. They go from red to a purplish blue. They go from that to a green color. Then they go to a yellow, and then they fade to tan until they finally fade away. Take a look at what they say are bruises. Take a look at any red or purplish type marks on this arm. Take a look and see if you can see anything there. Take a look, here is the bruise. States Exhibit 17, they say, is on the shoulder. Is this a reddish bruise? Is this purplish? Is this an ugly, nasty bruise that one gets for falling down with 300 pounds of weight on a lawn? When you go back there, look at what they say is a bruise on the foot. Do you see a reddish bruise, a purplish, a nasty bruise that you're going to get from the actions that they described in this case? Let's take a look at, at uh, States Exhibit 12. You have to determine when you look at these, the age of these bruises that you see. Dr. Lotman, her own physician, said these bruises could be as old as 10 days old. These photographs are taken on April 1st at 4 o'clock or 4.30 in the afternoon, less than 60 hours after these events. That's when these photographs are taken. You don't see any ugly, nasty bruises. You don't see bruises that you would expect from some type of a violent encounter. Please, when, I, when you go back in there, I ask you to look closely at these photographs. And where are there no bruises? There's absolutely no bruises on the rib area at all. They say that there's this damage to the rib, a rib contusion, and yet there's not a single mark where these ribs are. Not a single mark, not any kind of a bruise, nothing to show any damage to this area, nothing whatsoever. And the hip, absolutely nothing on the hip. No bruising, no damages, no purplish welts, 
no abrasions, no cuts, none. We know that this, this dress, it's either just below the knee or just above the knee. If it's above the knee, the knees are going to hit the ground and be scraped. If it's below the knee, the dress is going to be damaged when the knees hit the ground. Something has to be damaged there. When you fall forward, what is your national, natural response? When you're falling, the first thing you do is you put out your hands to stop yourself. Is there any kind of damage to the palms, any kind of dirt, any kind of staining or grass stains, any kind of mud on there, anything in the fingernails, any kind of scratches, any kind of damage to these palms because when you're falling forward to hit the ground, that's the first thing you do is put out your hands. There's none, no damage whatsoever. I know uh, many of you have children. You know that when children go out and get into injuries like this, they have linear abrasions, like scraping your hand across a surface, scraping your elbows across a surface. You're going to have those kind of straight line striations like that. And you take it and clean it out, and wash it out, put mercuricome on it, and put bandages on it. There's no injuries like that whatsoever, none. And then we get the, the testimony about the top of the stairs and falling. She originally says she falls at the top of the stairs and is rolling around on the ground, rolling around. I'd like to take a minute to show you the photographs of these stairs. I know we haven't been able to go out there and see that we have photographs showing what these stairs look like. This is the stairway going from the beach up to the property. Take a look at these stairs. Take a look at the walls along here. This is something that's at least 50 or 60 years old in poor repair. Uh, Smith trial, Roy Black is now giving his closing arguments showing the jury photographs of bruises on the alleged victim, explaining how she got those earlier. He showed them photos of stairs and broken and rough concrete, saying there's no way the alleged victim could have supposedly fallen at the top of those stairs and not come away undamaged. What you have to first of all look at is to see that all these photographs are of the same bruises. And I'd ask you to look at them because you will see there is a small birthmark up towards the top in this photograph. And you will see that repeated. Here it is again in this photograph. It is here on this photograph. And you can barely see it on this photograph. You probably have to look closely on this one. But these four photographs are all of the same bruises. They're not separate. And you can tell by looking at the birthmark on each one of these. These are brownish, yellowish bruises. Look at them closely when you go back into the jury room. These are not red, ugly bruises. These are not purplish bruises. These are not recent bruises. These are take these photographs are taken. The Polaroids are taken that same afternoon of March 30th. The others are taken on April 1st in the afternoon. Please, when you go back there, look at these. Look at the color. Look how they're turning yellowish. These are not recent bruises. One other thing that you have to look at, because I know that there's going to be an argument that these bruises in some way signify a hand, because they're going to say that this large mark is the thumb and these are fingers. I would ask you, when you go back into the jury room, to look at this closely, and there's three others, so you can put yourself in a sequence here to determine how this is done. In order to have, this is the leg standing up, in order to do this, 
you would have to be touching the leg in some fashion like this. And, and not like this, I want to explain a little bit further. This is not a grabbing action. You know that when you grab something, you have your thumb on one side and your other fingers on the other. That's how you grab. That's not the configuration of this item. This item is somehow like this. And if you will see here, these marks go in an upward loop, not downward. If your fingers are like this, your thumb would be here, and these go downwards. These two are higher than these two fingers. Yet when you look at here, the middle is higher. It would have to be somehow like this, that you couldn't even produce this using a hand. This, is about, this would have to be the most awkward possible way of using the human hand in some fashion that is not even in a grabbing motion. And I ask you to please, when you go back into the jury room, look at these photographs and, and use your own critical examination and common, self, common sense to determine what this is. I think you'll see that these are old bruises and they cannot be done in a, by a human hand unless it is in the most extremely awkward position that would be impossible to be done under the circumstances of the descriptions in this case. The rest of the photographs, you can see nothing. You take a look at States Exhibit 16, there is nothing there. Please, take a close look at this. There is nothing there. there. Again, Exhibit 15. Nothing in 15. Look at each one of these. And you can see that either there is nothing there or is old discolorations that have nothing to do with this case. Dr. Lockman testified that in his examination he could find no objective signs of injury. And that's the key part here. There are no objective signs of injury. All we have is a faded bruise. All he saw is a faded bruise on the left shoulder, which is not consistent with the force that has been testified here, the force of this tackle that supposedly occurred. There is no objective signs of trauma to this body. All there is are statements that all there ever was in this case is somebody saying, yes, it hurts here. That is it. A subjective statement. No objective findings whatsoever. No matter how many x-rays they did, there was no objective finding. They were all perfectly normal x-rays both at the hospital and at Dr. Lotman's office. There are no objective findings at all. Everything is purely subjective. Yes, it hurts when you touch that. The same person made the same complaints in the past. We showed medical records to Dr. Lotman. He was unaware of the findings in these older medical records from 1988, 1989. The same complaint was made about hurting in those areas, in the that rib area, in the shoulder area. This idea of, of rib contusion, there's absolutely no objective finding at all. Nothing came out from the examination. All there is is a subjective statement. No x-ray, no examination, no bruise on top of it, no damage at all. No cut, no abrasion, no scratch, no blood. Absolutely nothing associated there at all. And there's not even any follow-up treatment. You heard from Dr. L see him on that uh, Friday. She never came back again. Never followed up. Never exhibited any further pain, any other need for medical treatment. You know that if 
if you had some damage there, like a cracked rib, that is something that's painful. And you would go back for treatment. There's absolutely no evidence of it at all. At the very least, there would be some black and blue marks in that area. And there's absolutely nothing. I wanted to, to talk to you about the evidence of Dr. Good. Dr. Good was attacked in every Some local hospital. cable operators will be about cutting away for a commercial message kind of at this time. CNN kind of live of coverage of the William Kennedy Smith trial continues. Been, had university positions for so long, but not once was his opinion attacked. That's because the opinion that he gave is based on general human common sense. Now, this is the kind of thing I admit that's embarrassing to talk about. Anytime we talk about sexual matters, it's embarrassing. And it's embarrassing in this courtroom to talk about it. But it's something that has to be discussed because of the allegations that were made. Let me read to you what's on the questionnaire. This is a questionnaire followed up with statements on page 5. And this questionnaire is in evidence as Defendant's Exhibit 43. You can, when you get back to the jury room, you can read it for yourself. You don't have to rely upon what I tell you. She checks that the offender, the, the question is, was the offender able to obtain and maintain an erection sufficient for sexual intercourse? The answer is no. Underneath that, did the offender have a partial erection? Yes. What do we know about uh, human sexual response? The testimony of Dr. Good tells us with a partially erect penis. It had to be a voluntary consensual act because it could not be done involuntarily. She had to help. She had to be receptive. She had to assist the male in order for there to be penetration under these circumstances. Without that assistance, it could not be done... For those viewers rejoining us following a local commercial break, CNN is bringing you live coverage of the William Kennedy Smith trial. And there's no doubt that that can occur, and that's not what we're telling you. What, what we're saying is the description in this case of a forcible penetration with only a partially erect penis, under the circumstances as described, could not occur. Dr. Good says, as she says, if she was making it difficult, if she was struggling as hard as she say that she was, if she was not aroused, if she was not lubricated, under those circumstances, a partially erect male could not do penetration. Now his conclusion, of course, is, and he was asked this many times, isn't it true that there's evidence of penetration in this case? And he kept saying, yes, of course there's evidence of penetration. And that his point is there's an inconsistency. The inconsistency is if there was penetration under these circumstances, it had to be a voluntary consensual act. It could not be a violent, forceful, involuntary act. He testified to how the female genitalia operates with blood suffusing the uh, organ, how the male organ operates. I don't want to go into to details on that. I'd probably get it wrong if I did anyway. But he testified that under these circumstances, it would have to be voluntary for there to be penetration. And we know there was penetration because of the semen found in the vagina. The 
prosecutor tells you that now their main evidence in the case is the semen on the panties. Since there's semen found on the panties, that proves that Will is guilty. We know two things occur. First of all, Will ejaculated on the beach, on himself. They then embraced after that. Secondly, they had intercourse up on the towel, on the lawn. He had already ejaculated once. Dr. Good told you that the worst method of birth control there is, is withdrawal because the human male does not know exactly when he's going to be emitting seminal fluid. Seminal fluid comes out before the male is aware of it. There's no doubt. Now the state tries to tell you that this, because there's seminal fluid on the panties, that's somehow inconsistent, and that's absolutely untrue, and the best Remember, she, after this, puts a pair of shorts on. Well, seminal fluid is found on the shorts. The shorts were not on when this sexual activity took place. But clearly, there was seepage that came out and got on the shorts, just as there's seepage that gets on the panties, just as there's contact between the two of them that semen is going to get on the panties. There's absolutely nothing about semen on the panties that's significant except that it shows that they had sexual intercourse. And think about for a moment the description of what happens. Will is supposedly on top of her. His right hand is holding her left arm. Her other arm is trapped between the chest of the two of them. His other hand is down at his side. He has to press his chest down to keep her arm trapped between them. If he raises up in any way, that arm is going to escape and be able to attack him. At this whole time, she is struggling. She is trying to prevent in any way possible any kind of penetration. At the same time, he's holding down these two arms, one with his chest and one with his hand. He has one, his other arm pulling up her dress. He then has to hold her panties aside at the same time. Hold them aside. And also, somehow get his semi-erect or partially erect penis into her vagina without her assisting him. He simply does not have enough arms and hands to do that, ladies and gentlemen. That description is impossible. Not only that, but for there to be actual penetration, there has to be the right angle involved. None of that could occur with him pushing down on her chest to keep her arm pinned between them. Unless he has three or four arms, this act could not occur. As I said, the withdrawal method does not work. Semen will come out of the penis into the vagina without the male knowing it. Dr. Good made that clear. Now let's look at this for a minute. perspective. She said that she planned an evening out that night with her friends, went to their house, and yet does not remember that three days before she calls Tony Liat to make a date or have a meeting with him after he gets off work at midnight that night. She shows up at Ann Mercer's house dressed to go out. They have a glass of wine. She has her Soma muscle relaxer at the same time. They go to Susie Kerasi's house. Susie Kerasi says they're there for about 35 minutes. They say they're there for two hours. 
they have at least one glass of wine there. They then go to Renato's. They share a bottle of Chianti with Chuck Desideri. They go to O Bar. She buys a bottle of wine, a bottle of champagne, excuse me, is sipping from the bottle on the way back to the table. We know from Mr. Cummings what her attitude was like that night. She was not shy and retiring, as they tell us. She was dancing with a number of people before she met Will. We know from both Ann Mercer and Mr. Cummings that she disappeared for a period of time. We know that had to be when she went to meet Tony. We got the, the state apparently now admits that that occurred from their description they gave you a little bit earlier. But the witness does not. That's because she gave five sworn statements and never once mentioned going to meet somebody at another bar. <coughs> now, none of this is that important. There's nothing wrong with all those things. There's nothing wrong with going out with your friends and drinking. What's wrong is trying to mischaracterize it. She comes in and tells us that an entirely different slant to those events than what actually were going on. Look at her description that she gives of Will, that he's nice looking, he's an okay guy, he's attractive, he's well spoken. He comes from a nice family. She was really excited to meet this man. She had connected with him. There's, when are you going to have sex with somebody? Isn't it with somebody that you're attracted to? It's somebody who you think is nice? Somebody from a good family? Somebody that you connected with? She, in one of the statements, she goes on about how she was starstruck that night, who she had seen. She saw Ivana Trump. She saw at least one other famous person in that bar, Ted Kennedy. She sees two young men with him, one of whom she sees goes over to the bar. A man who's obviously attractive, she finds out is well-spoken, somebody that she can connect with, somebody that she can relate with. She has an agenda here. She would like to know this person, have a relationship with this person. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing unusual about that. <clears throat> Look at what she says about men. And trying to understand her motivation. You have to take a look at some of the things that she says. On April 1st, she was asked questions about that. And she says that in her last relationship, she felt abandoned, that it was a pretty harrowing experience, that anger built up. I didn't feel I could trust men. And then I was pretty angry at them. I actually didn't see what worth that they had. They really didn't do that much. I don't trust men. Look to see what, what her mental status is. See what's in her mind. And look at the times. The statement is that somehow what Will says could not have occurred within the time periods, but the only two times we know about here is they leave the bar about 3 a.m. because that's when it's closing. We know that they're back, or she goes to Ann Mercer's house at 5.30 a.m. She left the Kennedy home somewhere around 5 a.m. because it, it's it's not fair to use the telephone call to Ann Mercer. First of all, Ann Mercer doesn't know when she got this call. But that's not the key times. The key times are the beginning time at 3 a.m. when they leave O-Bar. And the ending time has to be somewhere around 5 a.m. because they're back at the Mercer house by 5.27 a.m. She is there 
for somewhere in the vicinity of two hours at the Kennedy home. And yet look at her description as to what happens. She says they kiss in the parking lot, they get out of the car, they walk through the house, go down to the beach, they're on the beach for a couple of minutes at the most. She goes up the stairs, she's grabbed, then she's tackled on the lawn, goes into the house and makes the call, and 10 minutes later her friends come to pick her up. How long could that take? Where's the other hour and a half? What's going on for the rest of that time? You, you take a look at Will's description, that fills up the time between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. But look at her description of what happens. It leaves out an hour and a half of time at that estate. Something else had to occur other than what she has testified to. Because that, at the most, would take up half an hour of time. Where's the other hour and a half? And look at her, her story about what happens on the beach. She says they're standing on the beach. Will is taking off his shirt and is t grabbing the tab of his pants. She then turns and leaves. And she said she's 10 to 15 feet from the stairway. She walks that 10 or 15 feet and walks up the stairway. How long could that take? 20 seconds? Yet during that time, Will supposedly takes off all his clothes, walks down the beach, gets into the water, gets out of the water, goes back up to the beach in time to catch her at the top of the stairs. It simply cannot happen. And then look at Mrs. Lash's explanation of that. She did this in the cross-examination of Dr. Siegel. She says, well, what in her hypothetical question, well, if he's running up the beach and he's kicking up sand, mind you, if you're kicking up sand, it's going to be behind you, not in front of you, but kicking up sand and getting it on your body and on your penis, if you fall down at least once or twice so your hand hits the sand, you run up the stairs, and then you, have, you penetrate somebody with sand on your penis, and that's how the sand gets into the panties. That's their explanation of that. That's just totally, not only just totally made up, it simply cannot be. We know from the uh, examinations that that simply cannot be. And she keeps making the point that in spring break in Florida, it's preposterous that a man and a woman would get together after knowing each other for a couple of hours and have sex. In spring break in Florida, is it preposterous that a male and a female would get together after a couple of hours and have sex? And then she attacks Will by saying that, are you telling us that you went up on the lawn, put down this towel, and had sex on this towel with this woman under your mother's bedroom window? I, mean, I don't know how many times she asked him that question. You want us to believe that you went up there on this lawn in a private walled estate, mind you, and you have sex with this woman under your mother's window. Well, what's the other side of that coin? What they want us to believe is that this young man goes up there and rapes a screaming woman under the open windows, not only of his mother, but his sister, of two prosecutors from New York, and the father of one of them who's a former special agent with the FBI. They want you to believe that he ran across that lawn, tackled that woman who's screaming at the top of her lungs under those open windows where his mother is in that bedroom and rapes her. That's what they want you to believe. They, they are going to, they've argued already, the, what's the motivation here? And she's already said it once, I'm sure she'll say it again. Now we don't know what went on in her mind. We can't tell you definitively what the motivation is, but her 
explanation simply does not fit the facts of this case, ladies and gentlemen. All I can tell you is when you examine the facts of this case, it does not fit, her statements do not fit the evidence. The evidence that we know is true, evidence that can't be faked, evidence that can't lie, evidence that can't be made up, evidence that can't be speculated, the things, the hard physical facts and evidence that's, that, that's there. But look at, we can't, all we can give you is some possibilities here. This is her big night out. She had not been out for a while. She's in this bar. There's all kinds of famous people there. She says that that morning she's told to go out and get a life. Here she's finally connected with somebody, somebody who's nice, somebody who's well-dressed, who's not a bum, somebody who she can speak to. And look at the description. It sounds like she put a personal ad out. Young, personable, well-spoken, well-dressed, not bummy, from a good family, well-educated. He's a doctor. He's attractive. He's nice-looking. I mean, is it so unusual to think that this woman was attracted to Will? She introduces Chuck Desiderio as a cousin. Why would she introduce him as a cousin? Because she doesn't want to put this man off. They're dancing, they're kissing. Giving him a ride home is a perfect way to get to know this man better. There's nothing wrong with that, but we have to accept the look at reality. She's invited in for a swim at three o'clock in the morning. She, her decision is yes. She, we know she had to have taken her pantyhose off in the car. There's nothing wrong with taking your pantyhose off in the car, but what does that say? They go out to the pool. They go down to the beach. This is a moonlit night. It's beautiful out. The stars are out. There's a light breeze. The water's lapping on the beach. I mean, this is right out of uh, a romance novel. And we know that, uh, as happens on things like this, one thing leads to another. These things are not always planned out between men and women. Don't we know from our, our common experience about how people can be attracted to each other? There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing bizarre about that. There's nothing preposterous about it. But she says she was interested in Will only as a friend. That's her response to everything. I was interested in only as a friend. I would ask, I would ask you this. The Kennedy House? Smith trial, attorney Roy Black is uh, wrapping up his closing argument about the alleged victim supposedly coming back, back to the Kennedy to estate the after the alleged rape. Let's listen. She says that she goes through those kitchens, through the dining room, into the living room, in this dark house containing this rapist. There's no way she would run over hot coals to get away. Once again, in the den, she says, Michael, you raped me. Michael raped me. And there's this conversation that just keeps escalating. He's showing her his ID. I'm not Michael. And he's getting frustrated and angry with her. She's getting more and more upset and hysterical with him. Now, they testify about Michael that Michael is not the name used by her stepfather. Well, somebody here has to know who this Michael is. Somebody has to know the story about Michael. Somebody in that family, somebody who knows her, someone had to have looked into this and know who is Michael. What does it mean? What did Michael do to her? What is the relationship there? Somewhere there's an answer that we have not heard. Somewhere there's somewhere that, that there's the answer to this question. But we don't know what it is. We have no idea what she's referring to. All they do is they put on this evidence to say that uh, her stepfather, Michael, is not called by the name Michael. But what, where is this Michael? Who is Michael? What does it mean?
Once she goes back to her house and calls the rape crisis center, once she gets the police involved in this accusation, there's no turning back. Because once this accusation was made, everyone in the world has gotten involved. In the news media, to the police. Once she accused someone of the Kennedy family, there was no turning back. This freight train was on its way. She began to see how easy it was to get attention. Uh, people paid attention to her. People listened to her. People did whatever she wanted. They treated her as she wanted. As this thing has gotten on, she's gotten more and more support like it. There's simply no way to turn back once this accusation was made. And when is it? When are we to believe? that will form this intent to commit a crime. When is it that he decided that he was going to commit the crime of rape? Is when he asked her to dance? Is that what they're saying back in O Bar? When he, asked, when he met her at the bar and asked her to dance, he was thinking, I'm going to rape this woman? When he took her out to the car and she drove him home, is he thinking, I'm going to rape this woman? When he took her home and they went down on the beach together, he could have taken her off somewhere on this beach and raped her. And yet, it's not supposing until they're right underneath these windows that this occurred. When is it that this decision was made? There's simply no evidence here that he ever intended to rape this woman. Not at all. When she's on the beach, he goes swimming. She admits he goes into the water. He's not intending to commit rape. When is it that this criminal intent forms in his mind? When is it that he says, I'm going to rape this woman? And they want you to believe that the logical place to commit a rape of a screaming woman is under his own mother's open bedroom windows. Now there's no evidence here whatsoever that he's intoxicated or drunk. They've tried to put that inference in here with absolutely says that she never smells even the odor of alcohol in his breath and she was kissing him there on the estate. I mean, she'd know if he had any alcohol on his breath. There's none. She says she doesn't even remember him having a drink at Old Bar. Some local cable operators will be cutting away for a commercial message at this time. CNN live coverage of the William Kennedy Smith trial continues. Ladies and gentlemen, you, you have to look at what's happened here critically. You just cannot accept what is, what is said. You have to match it to the evidence. You have to use your common sense, your understanding of human beings. Sure, they want to ridicule the fact that there was sexual intercourse, that two people could meet and in a couple of hours have sex. Is that so preposterous? Is it so preposterous during spring break in Florida that two young people could meet and have sex? The decision you have to make in this case, ladies and gentlemen, is based on the law. And the law is that Will is innocent until proven guilty. That the state has to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. You have to have an abiding faith, an abiding conviction of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. He does not to do any of these things because it's the state is the one that has the burden of proof and has to prove this beyond a reasonable doubt that you have to have an abiding a deep rooted down to the bottom of your heart I mean if it was it's like as if you have to make your an important decision in your life if you had to make a decision like buying a home about getting treatment for your child 
about doing something for your husband or your wife that's important, getting medical treatment. It's important decisions like that that you have to think of. And you have to have an abiding faith, an abiding belief that you're absolutely correct. Because what the law says is the state has the burden of proof and that's beyond a reasonable doubt. If you have any doubt, if you have any reasonable doubt in your mind, you have to return a verdict of not guilty. This jury system we have is precious. We, have, we spent an enormous amount of time, I mean every day here for over three weeks picking the jury because we know that it's only the jury that stands between the state and the accused. It's only jurors like yourselves who operating under our, under our Constitution who stand <coughs> between the state and the accused. I think you remember what Judge Lupo had said at the end of jury selection about how important it is not to take an action just on an accusation. How an accusation can be false. That you have to have proof beyond a reasonable doubt. That you just can't rely on an accusation because of the, the absolute horror that could happen. There has to be proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And the only proof in this case that you can rely upon is this evidence that's been examined by the experts, by the technicians. This evidence does not lie. There's nothing more important than knowing that the evidence has to be beyond a reasonable doubt. I know that it's been said here time and time again. The inference is that you have to find them guilty because otherwise they're going to say he's a member of the Kennedy family and that's why he got off. I can tell that from the questions that were asked in jury selection, to the questions that were asked of the witnesses here. I mean, that is exactly the point they keep making to you. And you can't find somebody guilty because of the family he comes from. Sure that, that along with the tragedy in their lives, the Kennedys have had a lot of good things. They certainly have a, a lot more money than uh, all, the rest of, all the rest of us here. They've had some advantages that the rest of us do not have. But we cannot punish somebody because of the family he was born into. We can't punish somebody because of his name. We can't pervert the law because of who a person is, or who his family is. We have to follow the law here. The law says it has to be proof beyond a reasonable doubt. There's nothing more important in our Constitution than that. I know I've repeated myself here time and time again on this, but I just can't tell you enough how important it is when you're looking at this case to look to see if there's proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Because there is not. When you look at the evidence, the proof is not there. Under that analysis, the law requires that you return a verdict of not guilty. Because that's the only fair and honest verdict in this case, based on this evidence. I know from talking to each one of you, over the several weeks that we did the jury selection, I had the honor to talk to each one of you individually. I know that you're good and honest people, and that you're going to honestly look at the facts of this case and follow the law. And I know when, when you do that, you'll see that the only proper verdict under our law is not guilty. It's been a real pleasure for me to I've met each one of you and have worked with you on this case. And I wish you, I wish that God be with you in your deliberations in this case. Thank you. Okay. Okay, to Abby Lowell, very quickly, our uh, trial attorney observing in Washington, D.C. Well, how'd Roy Black do? A uh, very good performance, Charles. A very masterful, uh, methodical recitation of all the points he had to make. 
It looks like the jury will have a break. We might be able to spend another minute on it, but I'll tell you now, it was exactly what he had to do. Just a masterful performance. Well, the jury is getting a break. You're absolutely uh, right. Uh, I've got a question for you. Uh, Greta Van Susteren earlier had made a great deal about the evidence with the uh, alleged victim's panties and the semen stains on them, feeling that that was a, a key point of evidence. What key point of evidence do you feel that uh, Roy Black uh, brought up that would uh, rebut her claim that she was raped? Well, again, I didn't feel, as Greta felt, that he needed to focus all of his attention on what semen was doing on her clothing. I think he gave the jury an explanation that will sit well with them in light of everything else he told them. I've been making notes, as you know, Charles. I mean, he just did an incredibly methodical job of highlighting every single point. If you will, bruises are an important point. And he very much spent time on bruises to point out, because bruises obviously would be against consent, and how there weren't any bruises. And those that are there are not in the right places, and they were not even the right color. He talked about the, uh, the hand positions. If it happened the way that she says it did, how could he have, as he called it, he would have to have more hands than he already had. Talked about the stockings. I told you that he would make a deal about the stockings, and he did make a deal about it. That would be his emblem, and it was. He even cleverly used the times that I thought Maura Lash could use against William Kennedy Smith and used it against the alleged victim, talking about the mysterious hour and a half. What happened to the hour and a half if all that happened there was that she went and was without consent sexually abused? He did all the things that I think ahead of time we pointed out he would have to do, and he circled all of his argument beginning and end with the theme of reasonable doubt and presumption of innocence. He started that way and he ended that way. And then I want to use the word again, he methodically reviewed the evidence to undercut her credibility where he needed to, to bolster William Kennedy Smith, and to basically say to them, look, I don't know what it comes down to, but this case is filled with reasonable doubt. Well, there's no reasonable doubt that the next up is Maura Lash for her rebuttal. Uh, in about 10 minutes, we'll be back for that after these news updates from CNN Center. The Smith trial, Judge Mary Lupo has just come back into the courtroom and is giving some instructions to the jurors, the attorney, and the spectators. Let's listen. Of the alternates in this courtroom, in the hallways, or in the courthouse, and no one will approach them. They are in the custody of the deputy sheriffs, until they um, are returned to their freedom after exiting the building and being returned to a secret location. Any questions from anybody in here? All right, bring out the jurors, thank you. opportunity to rebut a few of the things and statements that Mr. Black said. First of all, if someone was going to make an allegation of rape and it was a false allegation, wouldn't the person say he was a monster, his penis was erect, and make it all fit together nice and neat into a, a story of someone who was purely evil? What you have here is a, a crime with a mental aspect. And you can see that in the way that it's executed, the defendant enjoys the cerebral aspect of this situation. He can isolate an individual, a woman like this, and see if he's going to be able to succeed in having sex with her. And that's what he did on this night. It may have worked with every other woman at Obar, but this woman said no. She's in the bar, obviously dancing with older uh, men, Mr. Mercer and Mr. Cummings. She's not there with a date, with a person. He can see that just from watching it. The first step is, walks out with his uncle, they go home, hey, I need a ride home. Get her into your territory. 
Then you get to that location. Well, come on into the house and see the house. And they go into the house. Well, now let's go down to the beach. The beach is an area where he's gonna, he can take off his clothes and let's see how it goes. It's the crime of a very intelligent person and you can see the, the aspects of it. And it may have worked with other women at Obar. It just... You know, if, if I were standing here and he had taken her car and I showed you all the injuries she had and we were talking about taking somebody's car, it wouldn't be such a difficult question. Once you start talking about sex and rape, Everyone's willing to accuse a woman of lying. Society treats the victims of rape different than other victims of crime. Under Mr. Black's theory of the case, nobody can be raped. Because there's a lot of women out there who get raped, and, and, I, and they're not, quote, I don't even want to say the word, lubricating. There's a lot of rapes that take place in this country, and entry is succeed. So if you get Dr. Good to come in here, and wasn't it interesting that when they asked him a hypothetical, they didn't even include the fact that semen and the DNA? And when Mrs. Roberts brought that up, he changed his opinion and said, yes, there was penetration. Then he started looking over there, um, then changed his opinion back. But don't you think it's very misleading to leave critical evidence out of a hypothetical and ask uh, him to draw a conclusion on the stand? He had absolutely minute experience with rape victims and he hasn't practiced gynecology for 20 years. He had to go see Dr. Hicks in order to get ready for his testimony in court to prepare as a witness. It's also interesting to look how these witnesses work in connection with lawyers. Um, lawyers take the victim's deposition and they question her and for instance in the deposition um, the defense attorneys we brought out questioned her over and over on semantics of tackle, what it meant for pages and pages. In court, Mr. Black only brought a couple of pages out. Then I had to stand up and bring out the full context of what she had said. Lawyers question and then give their questions to these witnesses who arrive at these conclusions. They worked hand in hand. Mr. Seeger, the plant, the um, soil man, didn't even notice the plant material that was in that container because his opinion was supposed to be on sand on the beach and he totally missed the plant material. He didn't even date his slides correctly and basically at the end of his testimony he drew the exact same conclusion that Mr. Fiedler did from the FBI that it was beach sand so he couldn't say anything more. Dr. Lee was here to be very charming because he told you the exact same information that Barbara Caraballo told you and he said hello and he said hello to the judge and when Mrs. Roberts mentioned that, he changed his demeanor quite a bit. He also said that the lack of damage to her clothing did not mean that she was raped. On the stand, um, on the closing argument, Mr. Black attempted to rewrite his own client's statement. The defendant had testified that Number one, there was this, quote, massage transaction on the beach, but that he then went in swimming. So therefore, all the semen would be washed off. He stated on the stand that she was not wearing her underwear. So there could be no semen on her underwear at that location. Then he goes up to this location on the lawn, and supposedly he has another erection and some kind of um, sexual act there, but his his testimony got pretty murky about climax, um, erection, uh, e ejaculation. It was never clear. And then it was he thought he was careful, and he thought he pulled out, and he, but he may have left. There was never any clear indication from his testimony as to what happened on that lawn area. It was very murky. And he was, the indication from the underwear was that semen was found inside the crotch, semen was found outside the crotch, semen was found on the um, stomach part of the underwear, and it was found in the back center of the underwear. It's fairly saturated with underwear, which is entirely consistent with her description of him ejaculating and it, her underwear being on and to the side. It is absolutely inconsistent with the testimony that 
the defendant gave in court uh, yesterday, but Mr. Black attempted to rewrite his client's testimony in his closing argument. Tony Leott turned out to be the best character I've ever called. They were so anxious to point out the fact that she couldn't remember any of this or that she was unclear about it that they couldn't see the forest through the trees. He said she wasn't intoxicated. He said she was an honest person. He said there was nothing sexual between them. He said that he had said, well, maybe I'll see you over there. It was nothing definite, that she is a nice, quiet person, and there was absolutely no reason for her not to remember this or to hide it. Nothing happened that would be any reason for any person. And she said, certain events of that night, in my mind, are confused because of what happened to me later. When she goes back to Obar, she meets the defendant, who is the man who rapes her. Tony Liot was the best character witness that stand because he saw her and stated she wasn't intoxicated, she was nice, she was honest, and nothing happened there. How did she fall? Theories on how an individual falls are pure speculation. Number one, it's based upon a lot of factors and, and at this point in time with adrenaline pumping and fear and all those heightened emotions you can't predict how someone's going to fall she has another factor on her body her doctor testified that her neck is fixed by a cervical fusion falling involves momentum gravity body parts where an arm is where a leg is you cannot draw an absolute conclusion from the word fall as to exactly how body parts are going to go. She has an, an absolutely unique physiognomy. This is not the case of a child or someone at play. This is the case of someone fearing, absolute fear, adrenaline pumping. It's impossible to speculate on how an individual is going to fall and what's going to happen if they fall in a particular area. A woman being uh, tackled or hit from behind by a man is going to crumple. This is not NFL. This is not two equal competitors. How difficult would it be for a big man to get a woman down from behind? It would be very easy. She could drop to her knees. She could be taken down any number of ways. With that much difference in force, it's not fair to, to go to a, a NFL kind of football a semantic description. She was describing being forcefully hit from behind. It's obvious that she didn't fall completely down at the top of the stairs. Remember that statement she gave on March 30th, 1991. She stated that she had been up all night and was extremely exhausted and pain and very, very, very upset. She was victimized by being raped and rape is a crime of violence and a traumatic crime. And that factor is being exploited now. Number one, Mr. Black's client raped her, and number two, Mr. Black exploits that in court. Objection, she was very. It's an she was very traumatized and distraught and upset. He goes into her bruises. There was no medical testimony to put on to say that these are old bruises. Dr. Prosco stated that bruising is a very individual. Um, was not taking naproxen, even though Mr. Black, in his closing argument, stated that she was. She stated that she was not taking, she did not take aspirin. Um, Dr. Prosco stated that alcohol doesn't call bru cause bruising. The color of the bruising as reflected in a Polaroid photograph is going to be mediocre at best. What the police do is document the location. This is not Ansel Adams at work at the police department to get the exact nuance of color. The doctors testified that, Dr. Lottman, that it was consistent with the time frame that she reported the rape. Uh, each person differs in their bruising ability. Also, if someone's grabbed, it doesn't mean that each and every finger is going to be recorded. It depends on what the injury is to the vessels. So that really, that part of his argument for Mr. Black had absolutely no significance and no basis in the evidence. Another little word game was saying there's no objective sign of injury. It's a very untenable position that's stating that only broken bones are injuries. 
In fact, medical doctors are trained, and Dr. Lotman is trained and stated that soft tissue injuries were a good deal of his practice, like in auto accidents and some other um, specific areas that he described, but these are real injuries. You don't have to have a broken bone and an x-ray to be injured. That's why people go to doctors, because they examine them, and the opinions they give are based upon years of training. They're not lay opinions. He brought out some uh, medical records that were never introduced into evidence from 1988. What does that have to do with anything that happened here? Part of it was something about bronchitis. What does that have to do with whether she was raped in 1991? She did go for a follow-up exam because she saw Dr. Prosco on March 30th, and she went to her own doctor on April 5th. He never indicated that there was more treatment that he could do for someone with these types of injury. When doc Dr. Prosco indicated in her medical records has good family support and she indicated in her testimony that her family rallied around her and was supporting her and she had no concern with family. Mr. Black now has not only uh, suggested that there's something wrong with her family, there is absolutely no evidence in this record to support that finding. Her mother walked in here and testified about buying her a dress and going shopping with her and evidenced her concern about her daughter. There is absolutely no evidence that her family has anything to do with this. And to ask you to draw that conclusion is wrong. This is not an accusation. This is a trial. We have presented evidence, competent, credible, and scientific evidence on each and every material element of the crime charge. This defendant is no different than any other defendant. He is responsible for his conduct. Unfortunately, criminal conduct occurs, and that conduct must be addressed in a court of law. Unfortunately, that happens. It's a fact of law. It's a fact of life. If there were no crimes, it would be an ideal world, but that is not the one in which we live. This defendant is responsible for his actions. He is the person that was there on March 30th, 1991, and he is the person. Under Mr. Black's theory about famous people, that would immunize any member of a prominent family. Those are specious arguments. The evidence in this case has related to the facts of this case, to the forensic evidence obtained from the victim, to the facts and circumstances of what took place on March 30th, 1991 at that location. The state did not orchestrate this event. The defendant chose the people who were witnesses because he committed a crime at that location. The state has proved each and every material element of the crime of sexual battery. On March 30th, 1991, the defendant, William Smith, did commit a sexual without her consent. This woman said no, and the defendant violated her rights under the law of Florida. Thank you. Uh, Abby Lowell, uh, some quick thoughts from you. Uh, what did Maura Lash uh, do here? How did Roy Black do in uh, his summation? Let me start with Maura Lash, Charles. If you remember right before she went up, I said that when you only have a few minutes left for rebuttal, I think it's a bad strategy to try to go through every point your opponent just made because by definition there are too many of them. A better course is to go back to the central theme of your own case and stick with it and hammer it. She has a very good alleged victim's testimony. She didn't mention it particularly once in her rebuttal. I think she just didn't use those last eight minutes very well.
People remember better what they see and hear simultaneously. So I'm passing out to each of you a copy of the jury instructions. These are copies for the attorneys. Fear not if I change some of the language here and there. Uh, they will not be major alterations to the typed copy. I join the attorneys in thanking you for the close attention you've paid throughout the trial. I ask you now to pay equally close attention to the instructions on the law that I am about to give you. William Kennedy Smith, the defendant in this case, has been accused of the crimes of sexual battery in count one and battery in count two. Before you can find the defendant guilty of sexual battery upon a person 12 years of age or older by the use of slight force, the state must prove the following four elements beyond a reasonable doubt. Element one, years of age or older. Element two, William Kennedy Smith committed an act upon in which the sexual organ of the defendant penetrated or had union with the vagina of the victim. Element three, William Kennedy Smith, in the process, used physical force and violence not likely to cause serious personal injury. And element four, the act was committed without the consent Consent means intelligent, knowing, and voluntary consent and does not include coerced submission. Florida law starts with the supposition that all sexual contact must be consensual. Consent is a term of communication. An individual consents to something by giving some affirmative indication of their approval, either verbally or through their actions. Consent, therefore, requires some kind of overt gesture sanctioning or endorsing the proposed conduct. Serious personal injury means great bodily harm or pain, permanent disability, or permanent disfigurement. Union is an alternative to penetration and means coming into contact. Before you can find the defendant guilty of battery, the state must prove the following element beyond a reasonable doubt. William Kennedy Smith intentionally touched or struck against her will. Now, some of these instructions will be repetitions of the instructions that I delivered at the beginning of the trial. As you know, the defendant has entered a plea of not guilty. This means you must presume or believe that he is innocent. The presumption stays with him as to each material allegation in the information through each stage of the trial until it has been overcome by the evidence to the exclusion of and beyond a reasonable doubt. To overcome the defendant's presumption of innocence, the state has the burden of proving the following two elements. Element one, the crime with which the defendant is charged was committed. Element two, the defendant is the person who committed the crime. The defendant is not required to prove anything. Whenever the words reasonable doubt are used, you must consider the following. A reasonable doubt is not a possible doubt, a speculative, imaginary, or forced doubt. Such a doubt must not influence you to return a verdict of not guilty if you have an abiding conviction of guilt. On the other hand, 
if after carefully considering, comparing, and weighing all the evidence, there is not an abiding conviction of guilt, or if having a conviction, it is one which is not stable, but one which wavers and vacillates, then the charge is not proved beyond every reasonable doubt, and you must find the defendant not guilty because the doubt is reasonable. It is to the evidence introduced upon this trial and to it alone that you are to look for that proof. A reasonable doubt as to the guilt of the defendant may arise from the evidence, conflict in the evidence, or the lack of evidence. If you have a reasonable doubt, you shall find the defendant not guilty. If you have no reasonable doubt, you should find him guilty. Let me repeat for you the criteria you are to utilize in weighing the evidence. It is up to you to decide what evidence is reliable. You should use your common sense in deciding which is the best evidence and which evidence should not be relied upon in considering your verdict. You may find some of the evidence not reliable or less reliable than other evidence. You should consider how the witnesses acted as well as what they said. Some things you should consider are, did the witness seem to have an opportunity to see and know the things about which he or she testified? Did the witness seem to have an accurate memory? Was the witness honest and straightforward in answering the attorney's questions? Did the witness have some interest in how the case should be decided? Does the witness's testimony agree with the other testimony and other evidence in the case? Has the witness been offered or received any money, preferred treatment, or other benefit in order to get the person to testify? Has any pressure or threat been used against the witness that affected the truth of the witness's testimony? Did the witness at some other time make a statement that is inconsistent with the testimony he or she gave in court? Was it proved that the witness had been convicted of a crime? I think the last two are inapplicable here. You may rely upon your own conclusion about the witness. A juror may believe or disbelieve all or any part of the evidence or the testimony of any witness. Expert witnesses are like other witnesses with one exception. The law permits an expert witness to give his or her opinion. However, an expert's opinion is only reliable when given on a subject about which you believe him or her to be an expert. Like other witnesses, you may believe or disbelieve all or any part of an expert's testimony. The defendant in this case has become a witness. You should apply the same rules to consideration of his testimony that you apply to the testimony of the other witnesses. Let me repeat for you the general rules that apply to your discussion. You must follow these rules in order to return a lawful verdict. Rule one, you must follow the law as it is set out in these instructions. If you fail to follow the law, your verdict will be a miscarriage of justice. There is no reason for failing to follow the law in this case. All of us are depending upon you to make a wise and legal decision in this matter. Rule two, this case must be decided only upon the evidence that you have heard from the answers of the witnesses 
and seen in the form of the exhibits and evidence and these instructions. Rule three, this case must not be decided for or against anyone because you feel sorry for anyone or are angry with anyone. Rule four, remember the lawyers are not on trial. Your feelings about them, should you have any, should not influence your decision in this case. Rule five, your duty is to determine if the defendant is guilty or not guilty in accordance with the law. It is the judge's job to determine what a proper sentence would be if the defendant is found guilty. Rule six, whatever verdict you render must be unanimous. That is, each juror must agree to the same verdict. Rule seven, it is entirely proper for a lawyer to talk to a witness about what testimony the witness would give if called to the courtroom. The witness should not be discredited by talking to a lawyer about his or her testimony. Rule eight, feelings of prejudice, bias, or sympathy are not legally reasonable doubts and they should not be discussed by any of you in any way. Your verdict must be based on your views of the evidence and on the law contained in these instructions. I remind you that deciding a verdict is exclusively your job. I cannot participate in that decision in any way. Please disregard anything I may have said or done that leads you to think I prefer one verdict over another, I can assure you it is a misconception. A separate crime is charged in each count of the information. Count one is sexual battery, count two, battery. While they have been tried together, each crime and the evidence applicable to it must be considered separately and a separate verdict returned as to each. A finding of guilty or not guilty as to one crime must not affect your verdict as to the other crime charged. I repeat that only one verdict may be returned as to each crime charged. This verdict must be unanimous. That is, all of you must agree to the same verdict. The verdict must be in writing, and on the following page is the form verdict. At the top, you can see in the circuit court, that is the trial level in which you have been sworn, of the 15th Judicial Circuit, the state of Florida is divided into judicial circuits, and we carry the number 15, criminal division, in contrast to probate, juvenile, civil division, and so forth in and for Palm Beach County, Florida. Case number 91, you can see it was the 5,482nd case filed. C is uh, a computer designation. F means it's a felony. State of Florida versus William Kennedy Smith, defendant. Verdict. We the jury find as follows. As to count one, we find the defendant either guilty of sexual battery as charged in the information or not guilty. On the line next to the decision that is unanimously uh, voted upon by the jury, the foreman or forewoman will make a mark. As to count two, we find the defendant guilty of battery as charged in the information or not guilty. So say we all, emphasizing unanimity, this whatever day it is of December 1991 in West Palm Beach, Palm Beach County, Florida, to be signed by the foreman or forewoman of the jury. Now in a moment or two, you'll be taken to the jury room by the bailiff. The first thing you will do is select one among you to act as the foreman or forewoman of the jury. That person presides over your deliberations, similarly to the moderator at a meeting, 
and signs the verdict form on behalf of the entire jury. I repeat that the verdict must be unanimous. It must be the verdict of each juror as well as of the jury as a whole. Now let me insert some things that are not in this, the standard instructions. All the exhibits will be brought back into the jury room for you to review. Feel free to peruse the exhibits. Do not fold, staple, mutilate, or steal any of the exhibits or Mrs. Allen loses a job and I've got too much work to do to do without an excellent trial clerk. The exhibits go in in one way and they come out in another way. If you want something, ask me and I'll run a copy because Everything is public record, but I need everything in and everything out, all right, as it is. When you step into the jury room, you will be guarded from the outside, as in every case, by one of the deputy sheriff bailiffs. The courtroom will be emptied. When you've arrived at your decision, knock on the door. It may take me a while to gather everybody back together because we're not going to sit here waiting for you. All right, we're all gonna separate and go about our affairs. When you've arrived at a decision, knock on the door, the bailiff will notify me and we'll gather everybody together. It won't be something that I can do very quickly. All right, so if you're waiting there a while, we heard the knock and we're getting everyone together. The verdict must be signed in ink. The bailiff will make sure that you've got a pen available. Now, in closing, let me remind you that it's important that you follow the law spelled out in these instructions in deciding your verdict. There are no other laws that apply to this case. Even if you do not like the laws that must be applied, you must use them. For two centuries, we have agreed to a constitution and to live by the law. No one of us has the right to violate rules that we all share. And now I am not allowed to have more than six jurors deliberate. And as you noticed the first day, we had three alternates and we lost one before the jury was even sworn. So we have kept two people among you to act as alternates. It happens very routinely that jurors either get ill, have happy emergencies, adopt a baby. I mean, things happen while the jury trial is in progress and an alternate has to step in and substitute. But I am not allowed to even let the alternates into that door or it would be considered reversible error. So I have to ask uh, the two alternates, Mr. Salea and Ms. Jackson, to stay here with me. They will not be coming back So once for, to you. So once you step into the jury room, you may begin your deliberations. They will not be joining you, okay? Is there anything you lawyers need to raise with me before the jury begins? All right, the exhibits will be in momentarily. And um, you can each keep your copies of the instructions. I will give you an original verdict form in a moment. Thank you, Mr. Grossman, for taking that. I need um, Ms. Jackson and Mr. Salay to stay right there. I told you I'd tell you when the time was. It is now the time that you can step into the jury room and discuss the case and deliberate your verdict. Now, before the jury retires, will you approach the Surely. <laughs> Well, the case is going to the jury after one final slight delay as the attorneys approach the bench and confer with the judge after 10 days and 47 witnesses. We're going to have to wait and see uh, what happens here. Abby Lowell, very quickly, uh, how do you think it's gone to this point? Uh, I mean, one can't score this by a sporting event, but what things of most importance do the jurors have to look at? I'll tell you, Charles, what happened in this very last day was that both Maura Lash and Roy Black did a good summation of the case that they each had. And what was weak in Maura Lash's case was weak in her summation, and what was weak in Roy Black's or strong in his case came out. It was basically a good wrap for the way the rest of the trial worked. All right, well, now that uh, 
This is Wrapped. We'll wrap for now, reminding you to stay tuned immediately for a half-hour CNN special on the trial of William Kennedy Smith to date. For right now, I'm Charles Jaco, CNN, reporting live from West Palm Beach, Florida. Me, you could have gotten any of those women if you wanted sex. You didn't need to rape me. And, and he said, I didn't rape you. And I said that I called my friends and that we were going to call the police. And he said, well, you shouldn't have done that. Nobody's going to believe you. I'd heard some very sad and some very dramatic testimony. But that I've been living with the allegation against me for eight months. I've been living with a damnable lie for eight months. And that what I really wanted was an opportunity to defend myself. After 10 days and 47 witnesses, case number 915482, the state of Florida versus William Kennedy Smith, has finally gone to the jury. This has been one of those rare cases that rivets the attention of much of the United States and indeed much of the world. Each side in this has its own story to tell. First, we're going to look at the entire case and at the testimony of each of the participants. The alleged victim had her story to tell. He tackled me. And I was on the ground and he was on top of me. Were you able to see his face at that time? Yes. Was the person who was on top of you the defendant, William Smith? Yes. Was the person who grabbed you the defendant, William Smith? Yes. Was the person who grabbed your leg the defendant, William Smith? Yes. Were there any other people out there at that time that you saw? No. What happened once you were on the ground? Uh, he had me on the ground and I was trying to get out from underneath of him because he was crushing me and he had my arm hit. And, and I was yelling, no, and, and stop. And I tried to arch my back to get him off of me, and he slammed me back into the ground, and I got, and, and, and then he, he pushed my, my dress up, and he, he raped me. And I thought he was going to kill me. Did he say anything to you? I was telling him to stop. I was screaming no. And I was struggling. And he told me to stop it, bitch. Where was his head? Uh, to the left side of my body. What tone of voice did he address you? A frightening one. Did you feel this was an act of love? Oh, God, no. It's an act of violence. And then there was the story told by the defendant himself, nephew of Senator Edward Kennedy, the late John F. Kennedy, the late Robert F. Kennedy, a member of the Kennedy family, a recent graduate of medical school, doctor, if that is the technical term one wishes to use, William Kennedy Smith. And on the stand, William Kennedy Smith had his own story to tell. Well, she unbuttoned uh, my pants and uh, I took her panties off and uh, with her help, and um, and uh, we embraced, and I uh, could feel her. I put my hands on her, and uh, she was uh, excited. And um, I asked her if she had any birth control. What was her response? She said, "We better be careful." So what then uh, happened? Um, she sort of sat up and I rolled off to the side and she put her hands on me. 
Where did she put her hands? She put her hands on my penis. And what did she do? She massaged me. And what were you doing at this time? Uh, I was kissing her. And so what happened? Um, I, uh, I ejaculated. <clears throat> After uh, you ejaculate, what occurs between the two of you? Um, I sat up and I asked her um, again if she wanted to go in swimming. And she said, you go ahead. Did you swim? Yes, I did. Right, did you ever look back at the beach? Yes, I did look back at the beach, and I can see that it wasn't on the beach. So what did you do? I swam back into the beach. And did you go looking for... Yeah, I put my towel on, and I walked uh, back up the steps um, onto the lawn. And what happened when you got up back on the lawn? Um, I could see standing. It was a nice night, and it was pretty, fairly well illuminated. And she was standing over by the house, and um, I walked over to where she was standing. She started uh, uh, pulling playfully at my towel, and uh, we started kissing, and um, we put the towel down on the lawn, and uh, uh, she took off her panties. And, uh, uh, and she, we were necking for a while and she was massaging me and, uh, uh, I wasn't excited, um, and she put me inside of her and we started to, she said, to be careful. And we started to make, have sex. I couldn't understand how this this nice guy had had turned into this into that one, the one who who raped me. That night, that early morning, that Saturday morning, did you at any time forcibly rape? No, I did not. Interest in this trial has been intense. The details have sometimes been mind-numbing. When we return, we'll take a look at those details that may have made the difference with two trial attorneys who've been there with us throughout the entire proceedings. I get out from underneath of him because he was crushing me, and he had my arm in. And, and I was yelling, no, <laughs> stop. We were moving together on the lawn, and I got more excited. And, uh, uh, and I thought I was maybe going to ejaculate inside of her. And, uh, so what happened? Well, I held her uh, very tightly, and I, I stopped moving. And I told her to uh, s stop it. And I called her Kathy. She sort of, uh, she sort of snapped. Did you say anything to him? <laughs> yeah. I, um, I said, and I don't know why I said the name, I said, Michael, you raped me. I stopped dead where I was, and I said, who's Michael? And she said, I've called the police, and I said, I hope you're kidding. This trial has all, had all the elements of a classic tragedy for both the young people involved, it's also had elements of the uh, classic Japanese movie Rashomon in which you have a crime story that's retold by four or five different people with four or five completely different versions of events. To help us make sense or some sense of those versions of events and all of the uh, testimony we've had, we have trial attorney Greta Van Susteren standing by in the CNN Detroit Bureau and trial attorney Abby Lowell at our CNN Bureau in Washington, D.C. Greta, a question for you. What in your mind were the one or two most important moments in this trial? I think the most important moments were the testimony of the complainant in this case and the testimony of the defendant because while the, all the other witnesses are important because they corroborate them, I think the jurors really wanted to assess those two witnesses and unlike the rest of us viewing the case we did not have an opportunity to see the complainant's face and to watch her demeanor and so the jury has a leg up on, on us in that regard. Um, Abby Lowell, a question for you. If those were the most two important witnesses, what was the most outside of them important pieces of evidence? 
I think, Charles, there's some circumstantial evidence that raised question marks that we've all been playing with this week. How did the stockings of the alleged victim get into the car and when were they taken off? If she says she did not ever sit, let alone lie down on the beach, why was there sand in the lining of her dress? If she says she screamed and yelled and she was right on the lawn underneath the open windows of the Kennedy estate, why did nobody hear her? So when you take away the two testimonies that may neutralize each other, you are left with some question marks that mostly go to her side of the story. Uh, Greta, a question for you. How do we assess the performance of the two lawyers here? There's been a lot been made about how Roy Black is sometimes borderline brilliant, and sometimes during this trial, in the op opinion of some people, uh, Moral Lash was borderline incompetent. Uh, did that even out on both sides, or did Black have a clear advantage in pleading this case? Well, overall, I think Black looks a little better in, in terms of who I assessed did the better job. But, you know, it's very easy to do a good job if you have the right tools and you have the right witnesses. In all fairness to Mara Lash, while she is not a dynamic uh, prosecutor, she's certainly a thorough and methodic prosecutor. And I think in her closing argument, she greatly redeemed herself. The one thing that everyone has to remember is that lawyers don't choose the facts and they don't choose the witness and they don't choose the physical evidence. And you can be sure that if they did have the advantage to choose all three of those things, that the case would look a lot better and look more professional. You know, to, to a great extent, you know, we're stuck with the witnesses, we're stuck with the witnesses' versions, and we're stuck with their performances. But overall, I would say that, uh, you know, Mr. Black uh, sh probably did shine much better and he did a great job in this trial. Abby, absent the middle name of the defendant and the 16 uplink satellite trucks sitting just to my right, this is a normal, if, if there is such a thing, case of date rape, acquaintance rape. Question, will what has happened here in the intense amount of publicity in your mind make it more likely or less likely that a woman in the future would come forward to report a crime of acquaintance rape? Gee, Charles, first of all, let me say that the way the state decided to try this case was not a date rape case. And I think Maura Lash actually said that in her closing, ultimately. She tells a story the alleged victim does, not of two people starting out having sex and then one of them deciding no, but of really being brutally tackled and forced into sex when she did not want to be. That's not date rape. So that's one interesting point because it's been called date rape, but it truly is not. As to whether this will make people more or less likely to come forward, I think there's a wash there. I mean, obviously I'd like to hear the verdict or at least what the jurors say afterwards. I think the issue, when it gets into the media, makes it more aware to everybody, and that probably does have an effect on people coming forward and I think people then see the publicity and say now nah, I don't want any part of this it's probably a wash a very brief question for both of you same question first Greta uh, is there reasonable doubt here or is there not do you have any idea well you're asking someone who has been a defense attorney for 12 years whether there's reasonable doubt I see reasonable doubt in basically every case as a result of my orientation however my view of the case is that the, there are a lot of holes in the prosecution's case and the charges are so serious that I think that the jury here is going to have a very difficult time and if forced to guess, I would vote for an acquittal. But jurors are, are unusual in, the, in that they, uh, they don't tell us ahead of time exactly how they're going to rule and I'm oftentimes surprised by their verdicts. So I guess I would expect an acquittal, but I'll wait and see. Abby, same question for you. I spent a little bit more time in the government, so I'll try to be objective. But if you make a list, Charles, you got dress without stains, stockings in the car, sand in her dress, hands in an awkward position, screams that nobody heard. Those are at least six good elements of reasonable doubt. Well, yeah, but I'll I would counter, though, that one thing, Abby. And that's the simple fact that I think the fact that those underpants were, were saturated with semen is very hard on the defense because they've really got to explain it. And if Mr. Smith hadn't testified, hadn't taken the stand, we would not hear his side of the story. And he claims that he was masturbated on the beach and then he didn't recall ejaculating in her. And if that's true, why is all the semen all over her underwear? And that's a very curious part about the defense case. And if the defendant hadn't testified, we wouldn't have that issue. Now, granted, if there's a tie, if people are unsure who to believe, it must be an acquittal. But the fact that the state is now in the position of having that powerful argument puts the Do state at a much greater a... advantage than what uh, I'd earlier thought. Well, when we return, we're going to take a look at the testimony of some of the other key witnesses in this case. There's plenty of other testimony in this case. One of the key moments of testimony came from a young woman named Ann Mercer. Mercer is a friend of the alleged victim. She went to pick her up the night in question, early on the morning of March 30th, at the Kennedy estate. The alleged victim telephoned her from the Kennedy estate. There were, of course, several versions 
of what she said once she was there. However, it's known Ann Mercer herself accepted $40,000 from the television show A Current Affair for her version of events, but on the stand, she also talked about her version of events. You say you went to the Kennedy home on the early morning hours of March 30th, is that correct? <coughs> yes. Your friend says that she was raped, is that right? Yes. What she tells you is that she wants her shoes, is that correct? Yes. Several times she was worried about her shoes. Yes. So you went into the house, is that correct? Yes. Into the house where the rapist is, right? I guess you could say that, yes. But then there was some controversy, as there always was in this case, about who told what to whom. In this case, controversy about what Ann Mercer told detectives. I think I asked her what had happened, and uh, she had said something about being on the beach, something about being in a room, but she didn't say that she was raped at those particular uh, areas. She mentioned, she blurted out that she was on the beach and she was in a room. Well, did you tell the detective that she was raped twice and mention the beach and a room? Yes, I did say that. Didn't you give a sworn statement on March 30th that told you that the first time she was raped, Senator Kennedy was watching? I don't think I uh, said that. I'm not sure if I did or not. If I did, that's wrong. By far the most famous person to testify in this case was Senator Edward Kennedy of Massachusetts, the, sen the senior senator from Massachusetts, the uncle of William Kennedy Smith. Senator Kennedy was at the estate that weekend in a room facing the lawn where the alleged rape took place with his windows open and he testified about what he saw and heard that evening. Did you hear anything at all that night at the Kennedy estate? No, I did not. Did you hear any screams? No, I did not. Did you hear any noises at all within the house itself? No, I did not. What time did you get up on the morning of March 30th, uh, excuse me, March 30, that's right, March 30th, 1991? I'd say about eight o'clock. Did you see the uh, William Smith at that time? No. When was the first time that she saw William Smith on March 30th? About mid-morning. What time I suppose would you... I'd put it 10.15, 10.30. Did you talk with him at all about the events of the preceding evening? No, I would talk to uh, him and uh, Patrick about uh, playing tennis with my sister Jean and myself. Did you ever ask him how he had gotten home? No, I did not. Did he volunteer this information to you? No. Did he ever tell you that he had brought a woman back to the Kennedy home with him? No, he did not. Also at the Kennedy estate that weekend was Patrick Kennedy, William Kennedy Smith's cousin, the son of Senator Edward Kennedy, and Patrick Kennedy himself, a Rhode Island state legislator. He testified that when he and William Kennedy Smith came back into the estate that evening, that Smith told him that the woman he had been with was a bit strange. He's quite exasperated because um, the woman that he had invited back was um, saying all sorts of strange things and had been calling him another name. Were there anything else said to you by your cousin Willie about this girl while you were going into the house? Yes, he said that uh, she had said to him that she had been to the house before. Um, she had asked him for his driver's license, um, called him Michael, um, and was basically, he said that she had been making, said a lot of strange things and actually yelling them too. Did he say what she was yelling about? No. Did you talk to him at all when he came to bed? Uh, no, I didn't. He said, uh, a couple things to me though. What did he say? He said, um, this friend of mine's really strange. Um, uh, she's threatened to call the police and uh, she called her friends as well. Well, did he tell you what she was going to call the police about? No, he did not. Did you ask him? No, I did not. 
I, uh, he said that uh, when Ann Mercer had told him, um, we've caused you enough trouble tonight already, haven't we? And he was very, he said that very relieved because um, it appeared that the whole uh, evening was concluding and it was over. Well, there's a lot of different testimony here to sift through. Now it's the jury's turn to decide whom to believe. When we come back, we'll try to wrap up this entire complicated trial with our trial attorneys, Greta Van Susteren and Abby Lowell. Was the person who grabbed you the defendant, William Smith? Yes. Was the person who grabbed your leg the defendant, William Smith? Yes. Will that, uh, that night, that early morning, that Saturday morning, did you at any time forcibly rape no, I did not. Now the jury has to decide whom to believe, William Kennedy Smith or his alleged victim. CNN, I have to remind you at this point, will be bringing you live coverage of that verdict whenever it occurs. Right now, for some final thoughts, let's go to Greta Van Susteren in Detroit and Abby Lowell in Washington. Abby, a question for you, kind of a, a broad general question to wrap this up. Is the only reason there is so much interest in this trial, the defendant's middle name, and if that is the case, have we learned anything from all this? Oh, sure, we've learned a couple of things, Charles. We've learned that having all the resources in the world don't necessarily make for a better defense. I think we saw that with some of the experts. I think we saw that, as Greta said, each lawyer, whether defense or prosecution, starts off with a case that is handed to them. I think we've learned as well that uh, there'll be a great debate about whether cameras in the courtroom are a good thing and they teach the public or whether they are just, just so much more media hype. I think some of the lessons we haven't even learned yet until we not only find out what the jury says, but why they say it. Greta? Well, in, I think that uh, I agree with everything Abby says, and I might also add that I think there is all this attention to it because of the family name, because it is Kennedy, because there are a lot of date rape cases and there are a lot of rape cases in our court system, but the fact that it's the Kennedy family brings a lot of media to the, atten to the case and uh, also uh, serves the point of educating the public about date rape and about the way our court systems work. Greta Van Susteren, Abby Lowell, thank you very much for your help during this trial and your patience. And thank you, the audience, for joining us. I have to remind you, CNN will have a one-hour special on the trial of William Kennedy Smith this coming Saturday at 10 p.m. Eastern. That's 0300 hours. Greta, if uh, in a case like this, when a verdict is returned, is the defendant usually uh, in the courtroom with his or her lawyers? Absolute right to be present. In fact, is required to be present. But the jury can return their verdict without the defendant present. But usually what happens is if a defendant's going to absent himself, he runs the risk of incurring the wrath of the court because he's required to be there. Okay. Uh, Greta, the day began, of course, when the prosecution summed up its arguments. Uh, could you walk us through the prosecution's summation, moral access summation to the jury? Well, more or less started a summation by thanking the jurors, which is something that all lawyers do because you're trying to get the jury to like you and to realize uh, that the lawyers appreciate their participation in the case. She then went methodically through the evidence, and as you recall, she discussed the elements that she must prove beyond a reasonable doubt before the jury can convict. And as she marched through the elements, which included such factors that, as the complainant had to be over the age of 12, and the issue about consent and overt act, she discussed the evidence, and she pointed to some of the most significant aspects of her case, which she considered to be the strength. Most notably, the scientific evidence, the presence of semen in the underwear, and the fact that it conflicts with the defendant's version of what happened that night. Uh, Abby Lowell, quick question to you. After Moral Lash, of course, came uh, Roy Black's summation. Could you walk us through that? What were the highlights of his summation to the jury? Charles, after Moral Lash sat down, Roy Black got up and methodically, and I want to emphasize the word methodically, went one by one through each piece of evidence which undercut the alleged victim story, starting with a dress that gets tackled but yes, doesn't have a mark on it, stockings left in a car, bruises that don't jive with where she says she was tackled, the description of how she was being held down, which would have required William Kenny Smith to have a third hand, and then attack what might be the motives of the alleged victim and some of the things she said about her last experience with men. And finally, kind of like a climax showing that Abby how could it be up. with, uh, how could this have happened under the windows, the open windows of the, of the defendant's own mother? So he went one by one through it, and he basically took each point that the alleged victim made and when he did it, he undercut it with what the evidence showed, re leading up to what his strong argument was, ladies and gentlemen, whatever else you can say about this, this is reasonable doubt. 
And Abby, what about uh, after that Maura Lash's uh, rebuttal to that that lasted only a few minutes? What did you make of her rebuttal to Black's arguments? As you recall, Charles, I was somewhat critical of the rebuttal, only in the following way. You don't have a lot of time on rebuttal, and you should get back to your main case. And as Greta has pointed out, she had a very good piece of evidence on the contradiction between what was the body fluids on the underwear and the testimony of William Kenny Smith. Instead, and I don't think it was effective, she tried to rebut Roy Black bit by bit, piece by piece. She would have been better off simply going back to her alleged victim story and focusing the jury back on that. Instead, she rambled in eight minutes on every imaginable point, but never really fixed on one. Okay, Greta, a question for you. What was the, uh, the biggest strength and the biggest, biggest weakness of Moral Lash throughout this entire case? Her biggest strength was the fact that she had this scientific evidence, and it's the one thing that refutes the defendant's version of what happened. Her biggest weakness are her witnesses. Ann Mercer didn't corroborate uh, the complainant, and she needed some corroboration for that complainant. And the scientific evidence in terms of the bruises was not that significant. If the complainant had endured more significant bruises, then of course the question of consent would not be so much at an issue. So Maura Lash would have been better off with better evidence, but that's true of any law case for any lawyer. She could ha perhaps also be a little bit stronger in terms of her presentation. Roy Black was a much stronger advocate. We're going to take this opportunity for a brief commercial message, but a word to the audience. If the jury comes back with the verdict, we will break out of the commercial and come immediately back. Florida, the jury apparently has reached a verdict in the William Kennedy Smith case. William Kennedy himself, William Kennedy Smith himself, just moments ago uh, walked into the courthouse, and now you can see a live picture of the defendant in this case having a seat in the courtroom. Uh, Judge Mary... Judge Mary Lupo has not arrived yet. Here you see him walking in the building to cheers of uh, some people outside. This is just a very few minutes ago as he came into uh, the building. One of his relatives here you'll see gives the thumbs up sign behind him. Now he's back in the courtroom and here is Judge Mary Lupo and we expect the jury in momentarily. Let's listen. Be seated. Members of the jury, we've been informed that you've arrived at a decision. Mr. Stearns, I see you with a paper. Are you the foreman of the jury? Yes, ma'am. Would you hand that paper, please, to Mr. Grossman? The verdict is in order. The clerk may publish the verdict. Excuse me, Mrs. Allen, I forgot to give my warning instructions. I apologize. I'm not used to um, working uh, in a group where I have to concern myself with this. I should have said this when I came out before you jurors arrived. There will be no public expression from anyone in this room upon the pronouncements of this verdict. Should there be anyone here, family members of the alleged victim, family members of the defendant, or anyone else, members of the media, who feel that he or she cannot control himself or herself, please leave now, because if I hear one response, meaning no applause, no boos, no cheering, no response, if I hear one response from anyone in this room, after the courtroom is cleared and the jury leaves, there will be hearings as many as necessary citing anyone who violates this order with direct criminal contempt and we will proceed with accordingly with those proceedings so feel free to leave right now if you need to okay i repeat that um, no one will enter the well of this courtroom no one will approach these jurors for any reason and no one will leave the courtroom until I say so and after the jury leaves. 
I apologize again to the jury. I meant to do this outside of your hearing. Mrs. Allen, you may publish the verdict. In the Circuit Court of the 15th Judicial Circuit Criminal Division in and for Palm Beach County, Florida, case number 915482CFA02, State of Florida versus William Kennedy Smith, we the jury find as follows. As to count one, we find the defendant not guilty. As to count two, we find the defendant not guilty. So say we all this 11th day of December, 1991. Excuse me, Mr. Black. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Go ahead. So say we all this 11th day of December, 1991, in West Palm Beach, Palm Beach County, Florida. Thomas Stearns, Jerry Forpers. Mr. S Smith, could you please stand with your attorneys? The jury having found you not guilty of count one sexual battery and not guilty of count two battery, I hereby enter an order adjudicating you not guilty and I will sign a judgment of acquittal as soon as Mrs. Allen prepares it for me. You may be seated. You are released from all responsibility concerning the case and your cash bond is discharged. I don't know where to begin, as I said to the alternate jurors, to thank you folks. You have been obedient, good, and faithful public servants, and I appreciate the work you've done in this case on behalf of all parties concerned and on behalf of the community. Our entire community is indebted to you, and we are all indebted to each other that we have a system where six members of the community sworn to be fair and impartial and follow the law, evaluate the evidence and arrive at a decision. Judges usually have very little to say upon the return of a verdict. It is unethical for a judge to ever comment on the decision of the jury. And most trial judges, believe it or not, who do this day in and day out are not concerned with the actual verdict. The trial judge is usually concerned with three things. The first is that the jury is fair and impartial. And I was obviously assured of that or I wouldn't have allowed all eight of you to be sworn. The second is that the judge rules correctly on all the legal issues that come up because if the judge makes a serious error, the case comes back for retrial. And the third thing is that the jury does in fact return a verdict no matter what it is. There isn't a judge I've met who likes to go through a retrial, a new trial, or a second trial if the jury cannot make a decision and the jury is what they call hung. I want you to understand um, something concerning this case. All the words that I have spoken, all the activities during this trial, are the same words and the same activities and this is the same process and the same witness stand that we do day in and day out in this courthouse. This has not been a movie for, made for TV. The TV has come into the courthouse. The courthouse and the people associated with it have not done anything for TV. The only difference between this case and all the other cases that we handle is that more people want to see, see the case and more people want to be in the courtroom to see the case. That's the only difference. And in one of the pretrial hearings that I had in this matter uh, that lasted over a few days, I recessed the trial at quarter to four to have a sentencing at four o'clock. At four o'clock, I sentenced a man who had been convicted after jury trial of first degree murder. All of these people were gone. There was one lone reporter from a local newspaper in the courtroom and there was no one else.
I want to make a public statement concerning the presence of the media at this trial and the presence of the cameras in this courtroom because I think it's important for you to know. <clears throat> there were several pretrial hearings and the issue of whether or not to allow cameras into the courtroom came up several times. And at one of the pretrial hearings, Sandy Boer, one of the attorneys who represents a group of media people, stood over there at a podium and said, Judge, yes, it's going to be all over the tabloids. Yes, we're going to write about it, and it'll be published in all magazines and newspapers. But you're going to be able to find a jury in Palm Beach County. You just wait. You're going to be able to find a jury. You will find citizens in this community, regardless of what they have read and heard, who will agree to be fair and impartial and follow the law. And you know, he was right. We found a jury in Palm Beach County with no difficulty whatsoever. We had so many qualified jurors that when we chose you folks, we didn't even get through to the back rows. And, and no one on, on one side of the courtroom was even up for consideration because we had so many of you who uh, agreed to come forward and follow the law. There are some people behind the scenes um, that I need to publicly commend for their work because they've worked very hard to guarantee your safety and the safety of everybody in this room and the safety of the reporters among themselves. The, the press has been phenomenally cooperative with everyone. They have been excellent in the courtroom, nothing but courteous and cooperative with me, following all the court orders, cooperative with the people in court administration and also in the sheriff's office who have been responsible. <coughs> I want to thank publicly Sheriff Willie for providing all the security and the well-trained deputies and staff that we have here. We planned this out very carefully with Lieutenant Rowe and Sergeant Gentry, both of whom exhibited tremendous patience, professional conduct, and a true ability to guarantee the safety of the jurors and the security of each of us working here. And I think that the work that has been done by those particular individuals and done by the sheriff through his deputies can, is absolutely perfect and deserves nothing but, but commendation. And there were a couple of times that, that um, I called Sergeant Gentry in or Lieutenant Rowe in where there were a couple of slip ups and uh, I had plenty to say. I demanded excellence from them and they performed. And I want to mention that. I want to also uh, tell you that you won't believe the deluge of telephone calls and letters that have been coming into this building. We had one person, Deborah Oates, who performed as a trooper for me. She was the court liaison officer with, who handled all the media relations. And Susan Ferrante, you met today during the trial, our court administrator, who organized all the relationships between the media and the courthouse. And believe me, there was a lot of work to do outside of this courtroom. You may have remember Regina Herring, who was the supervisor in the jury room. Uh, Ms. Herring and I had several meetings on how to select a jury in this particular case. And I'm really proud of the work we did. We've already gotten several calls from the state. We did not summons one extra juror for this trial. Not one extra dollar was spent to select this jury. Not one. We picked you folks from the jury pool that comes here routinely every Monday. And we've gotten commendations already from the state office because, as you can understand, uh, we're in a severe budgetary crisis at this point. I mean, to the point where I can't even give you those binders. I've got to take them back from you. Um, Chief Judge Hurley handled all the work outside the courtroom, and I handled the work inside the courtroom. And he went to many a meeting for me so that we could coordinate and I could approve through him many of the procedures that, been, that have been set up. And he gave me probably the most invaluable uh, person of all through this trial for me personally and professionally, and that is Nikki Pangonis, my staff attorney. 
we only have four for 49 judges. So when she was given to me full time in October and assigned to me with other judges, once I got the, the case filed in my division, it was um, wonderful. Her excellent legal ability has been invaluable and she's been um, just an asset to me and to the attorneys as well with the, with the work that she's able to help me with. I mean, with 375 cases and the caliber of attorneys on both sides of this case and a court file that's how many volumes? 25. 25 volumes. I, I can't manage all that work, sit on the bench all day and do the research at night. It just can't be done. And I, I relied on Ms. Pagonis and I thank her. Well, right now we've had a not guilty verdict uh, very quickly to our two uh, trial attorneys who've been listening. Uh, first to Greta Van Suster and Greta, any surprises here? No, I don't think it's a surprise, and it's real credit to uh, everyone that's participated in this trial, because Willie Smith has gotten a very fair trial, and all in all, it's been a hard, long battle. Everybody's tired, but finally it's over for all the participants. Uh, Abby Lowell, same question to you. Any surprises in this at all? Not a surprise, Charles. If you really objectively evaluate the evidence that went in that the jury heard, there was no other just verdict. This is the correct verdict based on the evidence. We may never know what really happened on March the 30th, but this is clearly the right result given the evidence. Uh, was there, Greta, a question to you, was there a turning point? I think probably the turning point might have been Willie Smith's testimony himself. You know, the bottom line in date rape cases is it boils down to a swearing contest and the jury looked at both witnesses, both the complainant and the defendant, and obviously did not find the complainant credible. The other turning point is that there just was not much corroboration for the complainant's version of what happened that night, and that's basically what hurt the state so much in this case. Abby, question for you. Any major mistakes by the prosecution? Uh, major mistakes? I think they're... Uh, I don't know what they could have done different, Charles. She had a very ineffective cross-examination of Willie Smith. She couldn't have done that better. I think there was a big mistake in calling Ann Mercer to the stand. She certainly didn't help. She probably hurt the case. I think the uh, prosecutor did a very good job on how to handle the alleged victim, and I think the alleged victim was, uh, has told her story the way that she believed it and the way that it came out as clearly as she could. I think Ann Mercer was a mistake. I think she should have done less cross-examination of Willie Kenny Smith. I think she should have emphasized Greta's point about the uh, body fluids on the underwear. Uh, I think the only thing that I'm surprised about now is why Judge Lupo is making an Academy Award uh, speech at the end of this trial when everybody's looking to hug and scream and yell and go home, and uh, it, that's pretty amazing to me. You know, it's a matter of rolling the credits, I guess. Uh, one final question about the judge, Greta. What about Judge Mary Lupo? How did she handle this case? I think she did a great job. She made sure that both sides got a fair trial. She let all the evidence come in. She didn't interfere with the lawyers in trying their case, and she moved this case. She didn't let it linger with a bunch of collateral issues, and she made sure, she was the referee in this case, and she made certain that both sides got a fair trial. And I think that uh, we ought to be proud of her for doing such a good job in this. Well, let's listen now as the judge tells the jurors what their rights are, including avoiding the media. So we have a plan in line for you. You, after I read this instruction, you will go with the deputy sheriffs. No one in this room is allowed to leave. They have a, a, a secret, very well thought out strategy of where to release you, how to release you, and so forth. But I must warn you in advance that I have no idea whether or not there are 15 microphones and cameras outside of your homes. So you may choose, you may choose not to return to your home and that the sheriff will talk to you about that okay you can also ignore and just refuse to make a statement and eventually they'll follow the people who choose to talk okay um i have not been pursued that may make you feel better i have not been pursued at all because i made it clear from the beginning i'm saying nothing about anything including things that have nothing to do with the case no juror can ever be required to talk about the discussions that occurred in the jury room except by a court order and there will be none for many centuries our society has relied upon juries for consideration of difficult cases we have recognized for hundreds of years that a jury's deliberations discussions and votes should remain their private affair as long as they wish it Therefore, the law gives you a unique privilege not to talk 
about the jury's work. Although you are at liberty to speak with anyone about your deliberations, you are also at liberty to refuse to speak to anyone. A request may come from those who are simply curious or from those who might seek to find fault with you. It will be up to you to decide whether to preserve your privacy as a juror. We agreed before this trial that the unanimous, unanimous decision of six members of this community would constitute justice. You have done justice, regardless of what your verdict was. By rendering your verdict, you have done justice <coughs> because we agreed in advance that your verdict would constitute justice. So for doing justice in Palm Beach County,